I'm remembering to hit record. This is the beginning of homework number six. We're going to be doing problems from chapter five and six. Uh, AS 1010, let it rip, Brandon. All right, 44. Uh, Wait, do you mean 56? Oh, my God. What the hell one did I pull up? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm running off of two hours of sleep. <laughs> All right, I feel you, bro. Um, like 50, it's not, did you just, uh, part two, that's why. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, all right, uh, x-ray photon. Um, what is the wavelength of an x-ray photon with energy 10 keV? Yeah, that's kilo electron volts. But physicists describe it as keV, just like you said. Or, um... 10,000 electron volts. What is its frequency? And then it gives us a, an equation, it looks like, or just a, one electron volt, essentially. How many joules it equals? Why don't you read that off to us? Because I bet everyone forgot. Uh, one EV equals uh, 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th power equals joule. Negative power what? Uh, joules, sorry. <laughs> well, that's just a little P for me. I don't like it when someone reads me part of a conversion factor and doesn't include the other unit because it's kind of all about the units if you think about it. Okay, what are the formulas we want to do to solve this? You guys might even know which formulas to choose, right? We've got the energy of a photon. It's a short wavelength little X-ray photon and we're trying to find its wavelength and its frequency. Uh, these are all in our notes, right? From huh? This, this was all in our notes from last class, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. And we even did this kind of stuff in our last homework, too. And we did this on the exam. <clears throat> I think it's a uh, it's good exercise for you guys to find the formulas sometimes. Even use your formula sheet. Would it be, um, that wasn't on the, the uh, quiz I thought, or the, the midterm. Sure was pal. I could have asked you this question on the test. I thought we didn't do atoms though and stuff like that. Um, I believe we got to, okay. This is a good question because maybe I'm confusing you with my 1020 class. What is the last notes you have before we did lab last class? It was building an atom. And then you said that wasn't going to be on the midterm. Oh, wow. Yeah. So building an atom was the last thing that we did. Yeah. And then yeah. everything behind that. Yeah. What do we No, Okay. Not before the test. What do we do last class? We had a class after the test. Oh, the, that was the light. Um, that was all the light and stuff. Yeah. What was the very, what's the very last note that you have before from last class? Before we did lab, um, it's we talked about black body and radiation. radiation. Did we do the Stefan Boltzmann law and Wien's law? Yes. Yeah. All right, body hell. Okay, good. So which, but those aren't the formulas we need. We need wavelength, frequency, energy. So, bust out some formies for me. I bet someone out there could find the right formula. Some intrepid student. Oh. I could always take a nap while you guys work on it. <laughs> <laughs> You don't know have any formulas that relate wavelength, frequency, and energy? I know we have them. I just lost them in my notes. <laughs> uh, that one. I have it from the last homework. I just don't know which one it is. I think we use like two, two different ones. There's um, three different ones. Well, three look, at, look at the quantity you were given, Dennis. That's kind of what this is all about. You've got an energy. 
you're looking for a wavelength in the frequency. See if you can find something. Um, E equals H times F. Love it. All right. What's H? Can that be to the can that be to the class? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that uh, a yes it can. Uh, was it seven times ten to the negative fourth power uh, joules per second? Uh, it's not joules per joules second. Time it's time second. Joules times seconds. That's the legendary Planck's constant. It's the it's a fundamental constant having to do with quantum mechanics. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. All right. Hold on. We got to slow this puppy down here. We've got to solve for f. And E should probably be in joules since we have joules in the formula, right? So Dennis, why don't you help me do some dimensional analysis and convert my energy into joules using your conversion factor, which is provided for you. All right, um, so one second. So we're going to do, um, the jewel. You're converting something into jewels, Dennis. What is it? Um, the, the energy. Correct. What's my energy then? The it's right up in the board. You can't miss it. Oh, the um ten, ten um. Why am I? Why am I not? Just say the letters. K E V. Okay, but. Do you have a conversion from KEV to joules or dot, dot, dot? Oh, 10,000. EV. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out where the block is here. Okay, yeah, no, now yeah. what do I do? Um, wow, you all is slow today. Yeah, that no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I know. Um, so you're gonna multiple. You're gonna put a multiplication symbol with a division. Love it. Now give me some units. Um, it's gonna be just give me give me a sec. Um, would it be would jewels be on the other side, right? Look, there's there's two other sides. There's up and down. I don't know what you're telling me to do. Uh, so we want to convert it to joules, so it would be on the top, right? That's right. And what goes in the bottom? Um, it would be EV, right? That's right. What's my conversion factor? Um, so joule, um, one point six to, to the Negative nine, uh, one point six times ten to the ni negative nineteen. Top or bottom? Uh, top. Okay. What goes in the bottom? Um, one. Fine. All right. Punch them up. Take a Actually, you don't need to punch them up. How many zeros do you have here, dude? Uh, you have four, so it'd be. Uh, add four. Uh, add four. Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty. Uh, no. twenty-three. 
You go in the wrong direction. When you add negatives, they go they go up to, to smaller negatives. Fifteen. Oh, to, oh, so as in like it decreases, so 18, 17, 16, yeah, 15. Yeah, like here's, so 15. here's 19 and you're adding in the other direction, right? Yep, I got you. So it's the 15, negative 15. That's right. Okay, geez Louise. All right, now let's <laughs> rearrange our equation. I'm going to do that one for you for my own personal sanity. The frequency is E divided by H. So that will be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 15 joules over seven times 10 to the negative 34 joules seconds. Punch them up. Uh, two sick figs. Sounds good to me, bud. Uh, 2.3 times 10 to the 18th power. Yeah, okay. What are my units? Uh, wouldn't it be hertz, technically? Because frequency? Yeah, it's cycles per second or hertz. Yeah. Okay, let's get the wavelength. That's the frequency. Uh, I was just uh, real quick. Is that equation? Gonna erase soon. Would it be the, uh, um, is it C? Uh, no, that's not it. Yeah, that is it. Oh, then it's uh, C equals, um, I, why isn't my brain working? Wavelength times time frequency. Yeah, and then, but you would. Um, that's, by the way, that's lambda, but you can just say wavelength instead. Wavelength. Um, and then you gotta, you gotta have F on the other side, right? So you gotta, you gotta divide or yeah, like that. Yep. The speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. The frequency is 2.3 times 10 to the 18 per seconds. Punch them up. <clears throat> What you got? It's uh, 1.3 times 10 to the negative uh, 10th power. And then uh, I think it's, is it meters? I Yes. Okay. Why don't we convert that to a more appropriate unit? How many nanometers is that? What's a nanometer? Is that a thousand? No, it's not a thousand. It's 
one times 10 to the negative nine meters. Killer. Let's do that. Add nine zeros, what do you get? 19, right? Huh? It would be negative 19? No, you're dividing by minus nine. So you're, you're adding, when you, like we talked about before, when you add to a negative oh, number, yeah. you go up so to zero. Two. Huh? Zero. No. Negative one. One. All right, so, but we don't need scientific notation for that. What should it look like as a number? Is it just 1.30? False. That would be 10 to the power of zero. You're at 10 to the power of negative one. Just put in your calculators. <laughs> oh, we'd have to move the desk now. Thirteen. False. This was supposed to be the easy one. Uh, point thirteen. Thank sure. you. X-rays have tiny, tiny wavelengths. Okay, this is gonna be a fun day. Um, it's fine, you guys are just a little sleepy. You just forgot some formulas, that's all. We're gonna get better, I know we are. <laughs> I think the next problem is another, is another riff on this, so you'll get lots of practice. Uh, do we all have it down? Because I'd like to erase. Speak now, forever hold your peace. Okay, uh, Brandon, you did such a great job reading that last one. Why don't you read the next one? All right, uh, 58 uh, thermal radiation laws. Oh, I guess. All right. <laughs> uh, question or part A uh, find, find the emitted power per square meter and wavelength of peak intensity for a 3000 K object that emits thermal radiation. So the book has weird ways of talking about what I would call the brightness. They refer to it as the power per square meter, which is just like a wacky thing to say. Uh, but they mean watts per meter squared, which is what we called brightness last week. They've given us the temperature of our black body our black body, our hot, dense, glowing thing. Did you say 3,000 Kelvin? Yeah. All right. We're going to use the Stefan Boltzmann law. Brightness is sigma t to the fourth, where sigma is the ye olde Stefan Boltzmann constant. It's a number that has to do with radiation. Six times 10 to the minus eight watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth. That number is always the same. Multiplied by 3000 Kelvin to the fourth power. Do you guys remember how to do that? How to do a fourth power? Yes, it's that X and Y button. X to the Y key, right. So what we want to do is Six, oops. Six EXP minus eight times 3000. Here's the key right there. To the power of four equals. 
What you got? Uh, uh, three or you, you want three six figs or two? Uh, four point nine. Uh, to the uh times ten to the power of six. God, I'm not dumb. My brain's just not working. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. We're all having a slow day. I'm a little tired too. Um, what about the units, Brandon or anyone? Oh, I don't remember right now. Oh, you don't need to remember because you just look at the thing. Ah, Kelvin's. <laughs> no. Kelvin's get raised to the fourth power and they cancel with Kelvin's to the fourth power. Oh, that'd be just watts divided by meter squared? Right, which is what they asked for. Ah, and that equals brightness. Yes. Look at this learning stuff. Yay. I love learning stuff. Now, each, each letter A and B has a twofer. They not only wanted the power per square meter, AKA the brightness, they also wanted us to find the peak wavelength emitted by our glowing object. We call that lambda max. And lambda max is found by Wien's law. Wien's law tells us that the peak wavelength emitted by any glowing object is 3 million nanometer kelvins divided by the temperature. In this case, that's 3 million nanometer kelvins over 3,000 kelvin, which should be a pretty straightforward computation. You just take away three zeros, but that wouldn't work. And divide the threes. Just give me a number. Uh, shit. <laughs> I'm just gonna put it in the calculator. There you go. Don't use your brain if it don't work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. One thousand. Oh my god. All right. Wait, what are the units? Uh, uh nanometers, right? Very good. <laughs> In what regime of the electromagnetic spectrum is that found? That would be that spectrum thingy we drew. Uh, that'd be IR, right? Yeah, infrared. Yeah. Uh, how many? All right. Bonus points. How many microns is that? Oh shit. A micrometer is ten to the minus six meters. What's a micron? Is that in our notes from last class? Huh? Is microns in our notes from last class? Uh, briefly. Briefly. There's a thousand nanometers right there. Uh, it works like this. So a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. A micrometer is a millionth of a meter. So a micrometer is a thousand nanometers. So it's one micron. Just for kicks and giggles. Infrared astronomers tend to measure wavelengths in microns. It's more convenient for them. Is it just like a smaller number so it's a little bit easier? Or That's exactly it, right? Yeah. You don't measure the length of an ant in feet, you measure the length of an ant in inches, or centimeters even, or millimeters. Okay. Part B? Uh, yeah, so here's the deal with part B. Part B is the same thing as part A with one small difference. We're changing the temperature to, I believe, 50,000 Kelvin, right? Uh, yes. I'm going to save my marker and use all the same infrastructure. So you guys should write it all again. This time subbing in 50,000 Kelvin where appropriate. And then punch them up. Oh, 
and shout those answers at me whenever you're ready. Uh, the for brightness, it'd be three point. Uh, let's go with eight three, three point eight eleven, or times ten to the eleventh power. Say that again, Brandon. Uh, three point eight times eleven or ten to the eleventh power. Oh my god. All right, I like that. How about the uh, peak wavelength? Uh, that's just... Six, 60. 60 <laughs> meters. Well, the machine with the electromagnetic spectrum is 60 nanometers founded. What regime of the electromagnetic spectrum? 60 nanometers. UV. Very good. Ding. Right there. All right. Is there like smaller than microns from that? Because isn't it 1,000 equals one micron? Um. Well, nanometers are the next unit down from microns. Oh, okay. After nanometers comes uh, picometers, I think, right? Pico is 10 to the minus 12. That would be 0 0.06 picometers. Let's go. There's names for all kinds of small numbers. Let's get names of large numbers up. And then, while we're at it, we might want these at some point today. Names of small numbers. Uh, let's see. Deci, centi, milli, micro, nano, pico. Then there are femtometers, and atometers, and zeptometers, and even actometers. Who thunk, who'd have thunk it? Yes. Like these guys who did this video of a photon traveling through a Coca-Cola bottle. They call it femtophotography. Sorry, I thought I was sharing my screen with you, but I guess I wasn't. Anyways, uh, that covers us for 58, correct? Uh, yeah. Then we have no choice but to go on to 59. Hotter Sun is the title. Okay, this one's kind of fun, kind of. Hotter Sun. What's it ask? Uh, it asks, what does it ask? Suppose the surface temperature of the sun were about uh, 12,000 kelvins rather than 6,000 kelvins. A, or part A, how much thermal radiation would the sun emit? Uh, part A says what? Uh, how much more thermal radiation would the sun emit? Okay, so this is a what if problem. Today, the sun's temperature is close to 6,000 Kelvin. What if we doubled it to 12,000 Kelvin? And part A says what again, Brendan? Sorry. Uh, how much more thermal radiation would the sun emit? OK. 
formula might be the correct formula for that. What quantity measures the quantity of radiation emitted by an object? That would be energy and time? No, that's not it. It's energy per unit time. Oh. Actually, it's power per unit time. Sorry, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's energy per unit time per unit area. That's not good. Really, they want to know the ratio of luminosities. But the ratio of luminosities will be proportional to the ratio, oh, sorry, will be proportional to the brightness. In other words, if I have a star of radius r, I'm going to calculate the light coming off one square meter at its surface and argue that if the surface radiation on one square goes up by a factor of five, then the radiation of the whole star will go up by a factor of five. The luminosity is proportional to the brightness. And the brightness is a function of temperature according to the Stefan Boltzmann law. Now, we could plug in the temperature and get the brightness in watts per square meter twice. That would probably be the best thing for you to do, I guess. Isn't, Let's the, just, huh? isn't the watts of the sun uh, 4 times 10 to the 26th power? Yes. So, we, so how would they change if we... So you, that comes, Brandon, from calculating the brightness and then multiplying it by the surface area of the sun. Yeah. Wouldn't you just times it by 2 then? No, because the radiation is not proportional to the temperature it's proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. Oh. All right, let me make an argument mathematically. Let's say there is a new luminosity, and let's say there is an old luminosity, and we want to find the ratio. The ratio will be the new brightness times the surface area of the sun, divided by the old brightness times the surface area of the sun. But the surface areas are the same. The radius of the sun isn't changing, the temperature is. And the brightness is proportional to the Stefan Boltzmann constant times the new temperature to the fourth power divided by the Stefan Boltzmann constant times the old temperature to the fourth power. And the Stefan Boltzmann constants are the same. Therefore, the ratio of the new luminosity to the old luminosity. Now, watch this tricksy maneuver. I could raise both temperatures to the fourth power, or I could factor out the fourth power and just take the ratio of temperatures and raise it to the fourth. That's the reverse of distributing the fourth power. It's extracting the fourth power. I don't know what you call that. What's the ratio of the temperatures? I've totally lost you guys, haven't I? No, 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 no. hold on. You just figure that out on your calculator, right? Well, hold on. First, you have to answer my question. What's the ratio of the temperatures? What's T new divided by T old? Uh, T more 30, 12 divided by 6. Um, that equals 2. Yeah. So what is 2 to the power of 4? <laughs> 16. 16, right? What's the meaning of that 16? Uh, 
just how much more radiation, right? So would it be 16 times? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, there we go. 16 times more radiation emitted. Jesus. Yeah. That's something to think about. And that's only, that's only what, doubling it. That's crazy. Exactly. The, the point of this problem is that small changes in temperature lead to huge changes in emitted light. Also, the Earth is very sensitive to the amount of radiation it receives in terms of its life and its ecosystem. Okay, so that's one issue. One issue that's 16 times more radiation emitted. And now we'll go on to part B. Uh, yes. What would happen to the sun's wavelength of peak emission? Okay. So would that, would that be the, the new sun or the old sun? Well, they're asking how would it change from old to new. Yeah. Let me erase here before I need some more board space. Is everyone good? Yeah. All right. In question B, we want to know the lambda max, which is given by 3 million nanometer kelvins over temperature. In this case, it turns out to be a little more useful to actually calculate the old peak and the new peak. So the old peak, which is the peak today, lambda max is 3 million nanometer kelvins divided by 6,000 kelvin. What's that give us? Five hundred nanometers. Where's that on the electromagnetic spectrum? Is that visible light? Yeah. What color? Uh, orange, yellow. I don't know. I don't have my thing in front of me. <laughs> oh, uh, blue greenish. Yeah, it's kind of teal. Yeah. Okay, how about the new peak? Two hundred fifty units. Nanometers. Regime. Uh, a UV. No. Is it? It's short of four hundred. Uh. Part C. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna write this down real quick. I was just yeah. Brennan's been carrying the the wavelength here. Someone else want to contribute? I can read it now. I I just wanted to write it real quick. If All right, take your time, Brennan. Because I got it um, up already. Uh, uh, do you think it would? still be possible for life to exist on earth explain wouldn't that just be no <laughs> yeah but why because it's a hell of a lot of radiation <laughs> not only is it a lot more radiation but it's also a, uh, a, a lot more uv light yeah. yeah is that good or bad for like cells it's awful it kills cells yeah. 
it, it rips them apart. That's why you get a sunburn, right? So, um, most life would perish under these conditions. Wouldn't it just st technically sterilize the entire planet? Because UV sterilizes. <laughs> um, well, I want to add something to that. Let's, let's follow up on that. Most life would perish as the sun would emit 16 times more radiation, principally I think it's principally, but I could be wrong. Or principally, principally in the ultraviolet. Um, some extreme forms of life might possibly exist, such as tartar grades. Do you guys know about those things? Those are those like microscopic bug, um, the water bears. Yeah, that, that can like survive anything essentially. Well, you show a picture of that. <laughs> yeah. I, sorry, I didn't spell tardigrades very, I was running out of hand space. Um, <clears throat> I guess they did this experiment with tardigrades where they exposed them to the vacuum of space. And they survived. Okay. Yeah, and the vacuum of space has a shitload more UV radiation exposure than the surface of Earth does, because our atmosphere contains a lot of ozone, which is, well, it contains a small amount of ozone, which is very effective at blocking ultraviolet light. So, oh, it's a TI. If you haven't seen these, the moss piglets, they call them moss piglets. Look at these, look at these freaky little things. These little buggies here, uh, there's this some better pictures of them too. They can survive in some extremely harsh conditions. And they're found everywhere. Huh? I'm just, I didn't get to finish writing. I was just... Okay, but check out this tardigrade. Look at that. That's the shit out of your nightmares right there. These little buggies can survive ultraviolet radiation. They dry out in the vacuum of space, and then when you put them back into water, they kind of rehydrate and get going again. Life is potent. It can, like, maybe, maybe we are weak, but life in general is, is generally strong. Tartigrades? I think that AR should be an I. Let me know when you're all set, Tess. I don't know about my spelling of principally. It doesn't look right. Yeah. I guess it was right. Damn, I'm good. How are we doing, Jess? I'm good, thank you. Sure. How about everybody else? Dennis, you good? Good. Brandon? Oh, yeah. All right, cool. Three down, two to go. Uh, How are we doing? We're doing a better on time now. Chapter six. I'll, I'll just read them off, because I got them all pulled up. Yeah, you might as well. Um, I'm erasing. It's 50. Chapter 6, 52? Yeah. Chapter 6, number 52. Title? Uh, I think this is right. I don't, I don't know. Finding Planets? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, suppose you were looking at your own solar system from a distance of 10 light years. Um, 
Part A, what angular resolution would you need to use the sun and Jupiter as distinct points of light? Okay, so here's the sun and here's the planet Jupiter. And we're looking at them from Earth. I'm sorry, we're not looking at them from Earth. We're looking at them from some distant star system like Sirius. So here you are on a, on a foreign planet. This is your eyeball, okay? And you're looking at them from a distance of 10 light years away. That means uh, the planet is going to subtend some angle, which in this case we're going to call alpha from, from the star. And I can actually kind of show you an example of this. One of the first ever images of an exo extrasolar planet, a planet outside of our solar system, is just a crummy, crummy little image of what's known as a hot Jupiter. And, um, hey. Come on, you stupid internet. Uh, it's not a great photo. Here it is. So the star actually, they had to block the light out from the star by putting a baffle over it. That little black disc blocks the light of the star. So the, let me, let me draw on this here. The star would be here and the planets here and they're separated by some angle in, in your field of view, some number of arc seconds. Usually the angle is really, really tiny. You need a very powerful telescope to separate the two. Now, um, I think they ask us, well, what do they ask us in part A? First of all, does anyone know how far away Jupiter is from the sun? How many AU from the sun is Jupiter? How many AU is Earth from the sun? One. All right. Because if you couldn't answer that, then I was going to be a little weirded out. Jupiter is five AU from the sun. And one light year is a very big unit of distance, 9.5 trillion kilometers. We have to convert AU into kilometers? That's one way to do it, but do you wanna know what the really smart thing to do is here? Because we're gonna to have to do this twice. Brandon, can you help me convert 10 light years into AU? That turns out uh, from long experience to be the best thing to do to make this problem easy. What have you, what, wait, why'd you put 10 AU? Sorry, I don't know why I did that. Okay. <laughs> so we would do a dimensional analysis, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it'd be light years on the bottom, kilometers on top, yeah. Um, one light year, yeah, 9.5 times, uh, well, yeah, kilometers. And then kilometers on the bottom, and then AU on the top. Yep. And one kilometer, no, one AU is uh, 150 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. Excellent. So uh, 10 light years would be how many AU? So would that be 10 times uh, 9.5 and then divide? Just punch them up. I've given up on the head thing a long time ago. Let's just punch them up. Also, it's going to get tricky.
Holy shit, if that's true. What? Uh, what is it? Um, 633,333? Well, you know, you don't have all those sig figs, you know? Yeah. How about 630,000 AU? Holy god damn. One light year is about 60,000 AU, so that makes sense. Okay, um, now listen. We need to find the angular separation between them. Chapter two's version of the small angle formula, it, it, it involved degrees. It was like 360 degrees over two pi times S over D. Here, we're gonna use the chapter six version of the small angle formula. I call it the small angle formula part two. It's the one that, that puts it in, in arc seconds instead of in degrees. And the small angle formula part two is 206, 265 arc seconds times the separation divided by the distance. Two oh six two six five arc seconds times five AU over six hundred and thirty thousand AU. Can you guys read that? Just barely. Yeah. Okay. So what's that work out to be? And on the bottom there, it says One point six times ten to the eleventh power. False. Hey, that's that's arc seconds. That's not ten to the eleven. Oh my god. <laughs> also, I would never write any scientific notation like that. That was dumb. One point six units. Uh, arc seconds. That's not one point six times ten to the eleven, right? Hey, yeah. Okay. That was all part A. Now in part B, they're gonna ask the same question, but instead of being for Jupiter, they're gonna ask it for planet Earth, which is of course one AU away. So we expect it to be a smaller angle this time. I'm gonna erase all this. So you would just do that same equation just with one AU. One AU, exactly. So it should be pretty easy for us. So for Earth, S is one AU, and the angle is 206, 265 arc seconds times one AU over 
Quieres que ponga. Uh, 0.3 arc seconds. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, that was part B. And now we're going to do part C. One second, and I'll read that right off. Okay, part C. All right, uh, part C, compare the angular resolution of the Hubble, wait, that's, no, 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 sorry. How do you, how do the angular um, resolutions you found in parts A and B compared to the angular resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope? Comment on the challenge of making images of planets around other stars. Um. <clears throat> These angles <coughs> are both less than Hubble's minimum angular resolution. Uh, oh, sorry. Wow, I just screwed up. Hubble has an angular resolution of 0 0.05 arc seconds. These angles are both more, greater, than Hubble's minimum angular resolution of 0 0.05 arc seconds. So in theory, Hubble, can Hubble resolve the two stars or can Hubble not resolve the two stars if its minimum angular resolution is smaller? It can't, right? Huh? It, it can't. Uh, no, smaller angles are better. The tinier an angle you see, the tinier detail you can see, uh, right? So, yeah, so I, guess, no, I guess it could, yeah. Yeah, so in theory, Hubble can see these planets uh, at 10 light years. Well, we should add some extra stuff to this um, in parentheses, or maybe below it, we should say, in reality, the planets get lost in the glare of the star. So actually, the, the reasons we can't resolve exosolar planets is not for nearby stars, it's less a question of angular resolution and more a question of glare. Which is why in this Wikipedia page, you can see that they're blocking out the light from the star here. The fact that this exoplanet is giving off enough light to detect makes some people think it's not actually a planet, but it's actually a really, really low luminosity star. So this was actually a controversial picture. More often than not, the planet's reflected light is so dim in comparison to the sun that you can't see it well. And you can kind of see this in pictures like the legendary pale blue dot photograph from Cosmos, where you can see uh, Earth as a small dot in relationship to the planet Saturn. Let's see if we can find a good picture here.
I feel like that's enhanced, that one. <laughs> uh, no, this was taken with the Cassini mission. Uh, where's the Earth? Center right. Has to, it has to be that, the brightest one, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it has to. Oh yeah, you can see the moon there. Can you guys see the moon right next to it? Yeah. That's the moon right there. Do you see how compared to the brightness of Saturn, or Saturn's rings are much brighter than the planet. So imagine this is more extreme. Saturn's not a star, it doesn't give off its own light. So Earth's reflected sunlight, that's from 10 astronomical units away. Now try to imagine it from 600,000 astronomical units away. The reflected light of a planet would be really, really freaking dim. So that's what makes it hard to see uh, planets around a star like Sirius. <laughs> but in theory, Hubble does have angular resolution to see planets at 10 light years away. The next hotness in telescope astronomy, the James Webb Space Telescope, will have a dish three times as big. Um, that's the James Webb Space Telescope. And that should be launched in a year or so. That'll even be stronger angular resolution and will be more likely to detect planets outside of our solar system. So we're going to see some really, really crazy images of space. By the time this little puppy, this telescope gets into outer space, we're going to be seeing some very wild pictures of space and maybe even for the first time start seeing exoplanets as little dots around their star. So this is going to be pretty wild. Look at that. All those mirrors are coated in gold and beryllium. They're there in, in relationship to the size of the NASA scientists. That thing's just going to be floating in outer space, imaging planets and distant galaxies. OK, did everyone have time to copy that down? Dennis, are you still writing? Dennis, are you good? Uh, I'm just trying to read that very last sentence. Does that say, in reality, the planets get lost in the glare of the star? Yeah. All right, cool. That's exactly right. In reality, the planets get lost in the glare of the star. All right, I'm good. OK, we got one more. <laughs> just enough time to do it. I'm going to erase. <laughs> Last up, the picks of the 54. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, size, uh, the size of radio telescopes. Um, Let's draw a radio telescope. It's got a feed horn antenna and some dish. And then, you know, some superstructure. And what are the givens? Uh, the givens are, uh, what is the diffraction limit with a wavelength of 12 centimeters? 21 centimeters. 21, oh my god. There's some hardcore <laughs> dyslexia going on there. <laughs> That's OK, I do that all the time. And what's the diameter of the dish? Uh, what is the what? The diameter of the dish. Oh my god, a 100 meter radio telescope. What am I doing? That's OK. Um, they want us to calculate something called the diffraction limit. The diffraction limit is the tiniest angle you can see with your telescope. And the tiniest angle is given by this formula. Alpha minimum, the minimum angle, 
is 250,000 arc seconds times the wavelength divided by the diameter of your telescope. Now we need these to both be in the same units. So let's hastily convert centimeters to meters. Do you guys know the conversion from centimeters to meters? One, uh, one meter is 100 centimeters. Good. So what's our wavelength then in meters? Uh, 0 0.21. And this is a pretty simple calculation. Let's just plug it into the formula here. The minimum angle for our radio telescope is 250,000 arc seconds times 0 0.21 meters over 100 meters. What's that give us? <clears throat> Uh, 525 arc seconds. We'll round it to 530 arc seconds. How many arc minutes is that? <sighs> How many minutes is that? 8.8 arc minutes or nine arc minutes. Yeah. How many arc minutes is the moon in diameter? The moon's angular size is half a degree. How many arc minutes is that? Thirty. Thirty arc minutes. How many yeah. across would the moon be if you took a picture of the moon with this radio telescope? Each of those, the beam size of this telescope is like a third of the moon. So if you tried to take a picture of the moon, it would basically be three pixels across and three pixels wide. It would probably look like a cross. That's what the moon would look like through your radio telescope. It would look pretty fucking sucky, actually. Right? Because the beam of your telescope can only image points that are about a third of the moon's diameter. The point of this question is, why is this radio telescope so sucky? Why does it have such low angular resolution? Is it meant to take things farther away? No, it would like to have a uh, better angular resolution. The problem is how tiny an angle you can see depends not only on the diameter of your telescope, but also on the wavelength. And radio waves operate at really, really long wavelengths compared to visible light. At 21 centimeters, this property of light called diffraction will bend and distort your waves and make the image cruddy. All right, what's the rest of the question ask us? Um, uh, compare this to the diffraction limit of the Hubble Space Telescope, the telescope for visible light. Use your results to explain why to be useful radio telescopes must be much larger than optical telescopes. Um, I need a little board space, so I'm going to erase some stuff down here. Can you wait like, wait like one minute? Yeah, Please. sure. Yep. I don't think, is this our like second to last week of class? Uh, next week's our last week. Oh my God.
yeah so yeah exactly what he said oh, that's so crazy all right i'm good thank you okay um So, uh, we're going to take 530 arc seconds and compare it to the Hubble Space Telescope 0 0.05 seconds. That's 11,000 times worse than Hubble. And I'm going to write down why radio telescopes need to be so big. Radio telescopes operate at much longer wavelengths than visible light and thus have worse resolution. By increasing telescope diameter, we can lower the minimum resolvable angle a bit and improve image quality. Um, for years, the biggest radio telescope in the world was the Arecibo Telescope, um, which was in Puerto Rico. I think they blew this up in one of the James Bond movies. It was so big that they, they actually carved the dish into a valley, a mountain valley in Puerto Rico. And you couldn't point the telescope that well. You kind of had to wait until the earth rotated. Is this the fast telescope? You have to wait until the telescope kind of, until the earth rotated into the field of view of your object. Today, the new hotness in radio astronomy, the world's largest telescope is actually just completed in China. The 500 meter aperture spherical telescope or the fast telescope was also carved into a karst depression. That's a kind of mountain valley um, in China. And this, this radio telescope is absolutely huge. They're making it gigantic in the hopes that they'll be able to get slightly better angular resolution in the radio spectrum. I wonder if there's a better picture of this fast radio telescope, a higher resolution image. Jesus. Yeah, the thing is totally insane. So you really have to make, look at this compared to those buildings there. You have to make radio telescopes absolutely insanely huge to try to get better angular resolution. In fact, what we really do is we usually combine the radio telescopes together and all image the same object. It's a technique called very long baseline interferometry. 
and basically you have these these radio telescopes operating all over planet Earth, and as planet Earth rotates around the through the sky, all the different radio telescopes point at the same object, and it makes an effective radio telescope with a diameter that of Earth. And that's how they managed to image that supermassive black hole in a very distant galaxy in the radio portion of the spectrum. Because they basically were using a radio telescope whose diameter was the size of Earth. That allowed them to get very, very small angular resolution. Anyways, um, why don't we take a little break? I know I could use it. Uh, let's take a little break uh, before lecture starts. Give ourselves 10 minutes or so. Does that sound like a good plan? Let's yeah. give ourselves yeah. 15 minutes. Let's give ourselves 15. Let's pat ourselves in the back. Um, okay, I'm going to pause the recording. Don't let me forget to start it. Well, um, my original plan was to continue talking about radiation and some other aspects of light today and have a digression about telescopes even. But I've got to say, the fact that we only have this week and next week left kind of makes me think I should get on with it and lecture on the sun. So my lab today was going to be lenses and telescopes, but I guess depending on how far I get, I may actually decide to, I think I might just start lecturing on the sun instead. Or, or maybe I'll do like a hybrid. I'm gonna do uh, a, just a couple of minutes cleaning up some aspects of, of radiation and telescopes, and then I'll talk about the sun. I'm going to do a hybrid. That's the plan, okay? So let's begin where we left off last time. We left off talking about black bodies. So let's talk about, well, first let's do a review of what we learned last time. What are the three types of spectra produced by glowing objects? Can you guys help me with that? The three types of spectra that are produced by glowing objects. Is oh, anyone? My, my mic is muted. Radiation. Pardon? Radiation is that one or no? I'm I'm talking about radiation. I'm talking about light. If you take light and you pass it through a spectroscope or a prism. Like we, like we did in our labs, you can see different types of spectra in nature. This cartoon shows you the three types of spectra that I'm talking about. Uh oh. What are these three types of uh, <clears throat> spectra? They're described by Gustav Kirchhoff in his Three Laws of Radiation. Uh, black bo black bodies? No. That's that's one type. Oh. But a black body spectrum is called a continuous spectrum. Oh, an absorption line. And then the emission line. Or emission line, then absorption line. Good. So the continuous spectrum is a black body or a rainbow. And then there's the emission line spectra. And there's absorption line spectra. Where continuous or black body is the same thing as a pure rainbow with no breaks. Which I wrote backwards as rainbow pure. All 
I want to take a moment to focus on this guy, the continuous of the black body spectrum. Something that would produce a continuous or a black body spectrum is some hot object that glows. For example, uh, this tungsten filament in a, in a light bulb, okay? So here's a standard light bulb. Uh, did we do this problem last week or did we, I can't remember if we did a sample problem or not. Yeah, we did. Okay. So uh, for, for black bodies, uh, let me just stop the share here. Continuous spectra or black bodies are created by hot, dense, glowing things. They depend on temperature, not your chemical composition. Anything that is hot and dense and warm is essentially a black body. For example, uh, a person could be considered to be a black body because a human being has a temperature of 99 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 310 Kelvin. And that means at some level, they must be glowing and giving off radiation. So if we had a 310 black body, a human being, we could calculate its brightness, sigma t to the fourth. And if you plug in 310 Kelvin, I believe you get something like 500 watts per square meter. Let me just double check that. 310 to the power of four times 6 exp minus eight. Yeah, you get about 500 watts per square meter. If you plug in the peak wavelength of emission, you get, um, you get close to 10,000 nanometers or 10 microns. Do you guys know uh, what regime of the electromagnetic spectrum 10 microns is at? The gamma rays? No. Oh, no, no, hold on, hold on, sorry. You said <coughs> 10,000 nanometers or 10 microns. Is that an infrared? Yeah, it's, it's somewhere around here. Which makes sense, right? Because human beings, if they're gonna glow at any wavelength, will probably be infrared. That's how those night vision goggles work that the US military uses. That's also the logic behind like predator vision, right? If you've ever seen the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Get through the chopper. That's, that's there's an alien that sees in the infrared. Here's a kind of cool image from NASA, a thermal infrared image of a human being glowing around 310. And this has been color coded for intensity of infrared radiation. Where do you see the greatest amount of infrared radiation being emitted from the man? Uh, the brain. That's pretty cool, right? Notice that the extremities are a bit cooler than the forehead. So the, um, the extremities uh, are, are much cooler and giving off less thermal infrared radiation. So a human being glows like a little infrared black body. You're like a little infrared light bulb. And so do many other organisms. 
Some animals have even adapted extra sensors to detect in the infrared. So in particular, the pit viper has a normal set of visible light eyes, which see from 400 to 700 nanometers like we do. But these things that look like nostrils are a second set of eyeballs. They're infrared detectors. They're known as the L'Oreal pits. And they are actually low resolution infrared sensors. So they can detect the heat or the infrared radiation from little mice in the dark. And that's how they can strike and hit them without being able to see. So some animals actually have adapted a secondary set of infrared eyes to be able to see in the darkness. Uh, bees famously see a little bit in the ultraviolet because they can detect pollen grains on flowers better that way. Um, I wonder why human eyes have developed to have the wavelengths they have. The answer has something to do with uh, the transmission of Earth's atmosphere. So as you know, your eyes are sensitive to a range of radiation from 400 nanometers, which you call purple, all the way up to 700 nanometers, which you call red. But there are many other wavelengths of light that are, it would be possible to see at. Here's an interesting uh, slide. This is called the transmission of Earth's atmosphere. Our atmosphere is not uniformly transparent to all electromagnetic wavelengths. Most gamma rays and X-rays and ultraviolet light get blocked by our atmosphere, as well as good portions of the infrared. And while the radio waves uh, do make it to the ground, the sun is only a weak radio wave emitter. <clears throat> as you'll see in a moment, the sun's peak radiation is actually right in the middle of the visible wavelengths. And by a cool, curious coincidence, our atmosphere just happens to be transparent to electromagnetic radiation from about 400 to 700 nanometers. That's, of course, why we can see each other through the air. If, if we weren't looking at visible wavelengths, this would look like a fog that would be difficult to see through. So there's kind of a cool argument for evolution right in itself. So like, this is kind of random and off topic but that snake you know it had that secondary set of eyes that saw the infrared yeah like within different spectrums of light though are those the eyes essentially like kind of useless that, that secondary set like it can't yep. see at all yeah those eyes are probably only good in a small range around uh, nine to ten cool. microns just like your eyeballs can't see the radio waves that are constantly being emitted from your phone those infrared eyes cannot see visible light nor can they see ultraviolet or, or anything else. They're only good for the infrared. Now, a cool question to ask would be, what is the pass band? Like, what wavelengths do they see from? And I don't know the exact answer, but I suspect that they would center around 10 microns because that's where warm glowing objects give out their greatest amount of radiation as we sort of, I didn't actually make you do the calculation because I'm a little freaked out about time today, but you can plug it into Wien's Law yourself and find out that it comes to 10,000 nanometers. Um, so I suspect that they peak around 10 microns, which would be the greatest amount of radiation that we're giving off. <clears throat> I wonder what would happen if we analyzed the spectrum of the sun. Since we like to talk about the sun today, let's kind of get into that. So interestingly enough, if we take the spectrum of the sun, uh, I don't know if we talked about it in this class or in a different one. I, I remember Brandon answering this question last class, but maybe I'm remembering that wrong. What, the spectrum of the sun? Yeah. Uh, we had it somewhere. It's mm. a black body, but the luminosity, right? No, no, no. Luminosity is his total light output. I'm asking if you take a prism and you break apart sunlight, what will you get? The first person to do this was a British scientist named Joseph Fraunhofer. It was like green, blue, and like another color. No, come on. It's it's more complex than that. <laughs> Boston University, where I went to grad school, has 
a really nice heliostat, a solar telescope, and they have a spectrograph attached to it so you can take a very nice high resolution spectrum of the sun. This is what you get. So what is this puppy here? What type of spectrum is this? You mentioned, uh, well, isn't it all three? Continuous well, kind spectrum. of. Uh, pardon? Continuous. It looks continuous because you're seeing a whole rainbow, but it's not a pure rainbow. There are dark lines in this rainbow. Emission lines. These are not emission lines. Absorption. Absorption. <clears throat> So the spectrum is kind of like a black body, but technically it's an absorption spectrum. An absorption spectrum has a rainbow with dark absorption lines in it. These absorption lines tell us which elements are in the atmosphere of the sun. Some are due to hydrogen, some are due to sodium, some are due to helium, and other things. We've mapped them all out very carefully by comparing the wavelengths of each line to the wavelengths of the emission lines produced by different elements. Imagine if we tried to make a plot. And what if we tried to make a plot of brightness versus wavelength for a black body-like spectrum like the sun? So on this axis, we'll have the brightness in watts per square meter. And in this wavelength, uh, this, this axis, excuse me, We'll plot wavelength to nanometers. What would the spectrum, what would the graph look like if all the wavelengths were produced with equal intensity? So I guess what I'm asking is I'm, I'm asking you to just kind of for a moment, I'm asking you to forget the fact that there are these absorption lines and just imagine to scan along the colors and we're asking does the sun give off more blue light or more green light or more yellow light or more red light? If all wavelengths were produced equally, the graph would be a perfectly flat line because the brightness would be the same at all wavelengths. And by the way, we're going to include not just the visible spectrum, but other portions of the spectrum as well. So we'll have purple wavelengths of light, which is around 400 nanometers. And we'll have red wavelengths of light around 700 nanometers, but we'll also include infrared and radio, and we'll even include UV, X-rays, and gamma rays, the whole damn spectrum. If you make a plot of the spectrum of the sun, you see something that looks like this. It's a characteristic profile called a black body radiation profile or the Planck function. Slide 53. In fact, this graph shows two things. It shows an ideal black body whose temperature is the same as the sun or uh, 5,800 Kelvin. And the real spectrum of the sun is shown in black. And you'll notice that there's really, really good agreement between an ideal black body and the spectrum of the sun. These little dips in intensity here are the absorption lines that you're seeing in that image. Let's try to draw that picture, the spectrum of the sun. It's, it's kind of like a bell curve, but it's non-symmetrical. It has kind of a high speed tail. And for the sun spectrum, it peaks. Ix lambda max is right around 500 nanometers, which is sort of like the color green. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and, and the reason I know that is because you can calculate it using Wien's law. So the surface temperature of the sun is 5,800 Kelvin, famously. And if you plug this into Wien's law, you get lambda max is 3 million nanometer kelvins over 5,800 Kelvin. And I think that comes out to be 520 nanometers. Yeah. Which is pretty green. So it's kind of interesting that our star gives off its greatest amount of radiation at the same wavelengths that our eye is sensitive to. That means two things. Our eyes have developed to see the colors they see, to see the wavelengths they see, for two simple reasons. One, the sun gives off the greatest amount of light at these wavelengths. And two, our atmosphere just happens to be transparent to these wavelengths. That's a very co convenient, winky dinky kind of thing if you think about it. So let's learn a little bit about the sun. I'd like to start off by showing you guys a couple of fun slides to get you excited here. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. I'm not sharing my screen with you all. Share. All right. Oh, resume slideshow. Oops, that's the wrong slideshow. Okay. Here's an image of the sun, what it looks like if you look at the surface at visible wavelengths. Um, there's a number of different ways you can take a picture like this. Uh, one way is you can get your, first of all, you can look at the sun directly. If you guys get yourself a cheapy cheap pair of these uh, eclipse shades, which you can get for under a buck and Sometimes you can just take one of these eclipse shades and you can just kind of stare up at the sun and you can see its disk on the sky. You guys know what the angular size of the sun is, don't you? How many degrees across is the sun? Point 0.5. Point 0.5 degrees, that's right. So let's learn about the sun. The sun is covered in chapter 14 of our books. Um, seen from Earth, the sun has an angular size of 0 0.5 degrees, same angular size as the moon. And we can use this plus the fact that the uh, Earth is 150 million kilometers away to calculate some of the properties of the sun. So the sun has some fixed dimensions that do not change. And some of those fixed dimensions of the sun are the mass of the sun, two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. The luminous output of the sun also stays constant. 
at four times 10 to the 26 watts, the radius of the sun, which is 700,000 kilometers, and the surface temperature of the sun, which is 5,800 Kelvin. These are numbers you've heard me talk about before, but I think it's interesting to sort of start off there is these are measurements, these are properties of the sun that do not change. By the way, <clears throat> our sun may have a fixed radius, but not all stars maintain a fixed radius on their skies. If you were to live on a planet around the star Polaris, over the course of a month, you would actually see Polaris grow and shrink in your sky with your naked eye. Polaris is called a variable star, and these stars actually puff in and out like an accordion, and they do not maintain equilibrium. Our sun is in equilibrium, so we happen to live around a star which has some very stable fixed properties. The sun also has a basic chemical composition. And we know what the chemical composition of the sun is by studying the strength of those absorption lines, which I showed you earlier. The composition of the sun is mostly hydrogen gas, roughly 70%. followed by helium gas, 28%, and a remaining 2%, which are called metals or heavy elements. Heavy elements make up just a small fraction of the sun's composition. 2%. We sometimes refer to them as metals, even though some of the atoms are not metallic. Metals is like astronomy code word for things that aren't hydrogen and helium. Let's look at a couple of fun videos of the sun before we go any farther. So I'm gonna share my screen with you guys. Um, there's a famous satellite which is currently in orbit around Earth. And this satellite helps us uh, image the sun at a variety of different wavelengths. It's known as the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Let's take a little peeksy weeksy at that. I'm just going to get rid of some of my uh, slides here because I'm I'm worried a little bit about my bandwidth. Solar, watch this. If I just type SDO into the bloody thing, the very first thing that comes up is the Solar Dynamics Observatory. That's how famous it is. And the Solar Dynamics Observatory looks a little something like this. It's a smallish size telescope satellite that's in orbit around Earth, but it orbits Earth in, in such a way that it's constantly pointing towards the sun and is perpetually imaging the sun at a variety of different wavelengths. Now, if you guys look back here at the Solar Dynamics Observatory website, you'll notice that they have a picture up of the sun as it appears right now. So this picture was taken at a wavelength of 19.3 nanometers or 193 angstroms. And this was taken at universal time 1627. So if it's 1627 universal time, what was the time local time? How many hours difference are we from Six, England? Right. Pardon? Six. Five. Five. So this was taken at uh, 11.27, right? Yeah. Basically 11.30, which was one hour ago. 
This is what the sun looks like at a variety of wavelengths about an hour ago. Now, um, <clears throat> the sun does not currently show any sunspots on its surface because we're currently at a solar magnetic minimum. The sun is not very magnetically active right now. But I'd like to show you guys some videos of the sun from a couple of years ago when it was closer to a solar maximum. So here's what a typical image of the sun looks like at a wavelength of 4,500 angstroms. Now, uh, I just want to remind you from our spectroscopy lab that normally we measure wavelengths in nanometers. But sometimes professionals working in the game, they use a unit called angstroms, where one nanometer is 10 angstroms. So that means this video that I'm about to show you, this was taken at a wavelength of 450 nanometers. What color is 450 nanometers on the visible spectrum? Visible light. Oh, what color? You said what color? <laughs> well, I guess I should have asked what regime. It is visible regime. What's the color? Uh, violet to indigo. Yeah, it's kind of an indigo color, right? Yeah. Uh, I'd say 450 is a pretty strong indigo. Can you guys see that? Brandon, don't you think it's interesting that the sun looks yellow when they actually took this image at indigo wavelengths? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Could it, is it the lenses they use? No, they just fake colored it that way to make you feel good. And joke. that's because the sun looks yellow on the sky, doesn't it? Yeah, so seeing anything different would confuse people. Exactly. Why does the sun look yellow on the sky? What's the sun's peak wavelength of emission? Uh, does anyone know why the sun appears yellow? What's the sun's peak wavelength of emission from earlier in our class? Do you guys want to see a picture of the sun from the International Space Station? This is what the sun looks like when you look at it out of the porthole on the International Space Station. It's because of our atmosphere. That's yeah. Like, yeah. This is what the sun looks like from space. Let me get a higher resolution image. Why the sky is blue, right? Same. Color. Yeah, very good. Okay, wait. So, Brandon, can you help me work through that? This is a wide-angle, four-thousand-pixel image of the sun seen. What what color is the sun from outer space? It's uh, white. Pretty damn white, because it's yeah. a black body, right? So, how does this end up looking yellow when we get down to the ground? Because of our atmosphere. <laughs> All right, and what's that got to do with the sun, the, the sky being blue again? Uh, isn't that because the sun reflected off the water? No, yeah. no. That's a misconception. <laughs> um, here's the deal with the sky being blue. You can see a little cartoon of it here. Oops, sorry. I messed it. So let me go to slide 20 or slide 21. Oops. Um, when you look at sunlight, sunlight is composed of all the different wavelengths of light, red, green, orange, blue, yellow, the whole thing. But as light comes down through our atmosphere, the shorter wavelengths of blue light, they get scattered by atmospheric molecules more heartily or more effectively than red wavelengths of light. And they tend to scatter sideways and up, down, in all directions. And that means the sun has white light with blue removed from its spectrum, and it takes on a yellowish hue. It also makes the sky blue because those blue photons, they then ping and scatter sideways off of air molecules. 
so that when you look up at the sky, you see a uniform glowing field of blue. And that field of blue is all scattered blue sunlight photons. Now the sun might look yellow during the day around noon, but if you think about sunset, sunset the sun doesn't look yellow, it looks a kind of orangey red. That's because you're looking through an even longer column of atmosphere and you're scattering proportionally even more blue photons out of the field of view, giving the sun a reddish or a yellowish color. So the sun's not actually yellow, it's just white, but it looks kind of yellow from the ground because of our atmosphere. In any case, let's go back to our slideshow and let's see what the sun looks like at visible wavelengths. If you kind of take a peek at it through the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Now the day I'm about to show you is from a few years ago and it's about a one or two hour episode and it might be a little jerky over my internet, but I'm gonna kind of hit play and see what happens. So I'm hitting play on this video of the sun and do you guys notice any motion here? Yeah, it's going to the right a little it's bit. It's slightly rotating. How can you see that it's rotating? Because of the sunspot. Yeah, the sunspots are moving, right? Ever so slowly. Now, I want you guys to notice a couple of things about this image. Do you see how uniformly illuminated the disk of the sun is? This is a very important thing for our class. Because the sun's surface temperature remains so incredibly constant, the radiation that it's giving off, the thermal radiation is also very uniform with only a small motion from these sunspots here. <clears throat> I wonder if we could kind of estimate how big those sunspots were just by looking at this, this image here. So let's come up with some kind of corresponding ratios. I'm gonna take a ruler. I've got one over here, thanks. And I'm going to measure the diameter of the sun. I want you guys to write these numbers down. On my screen, the sun's diameter is 12.7 centimeters. So let's write that down. So draw a disc on your page. And have that disk of the sun be 12.7 centimeters. And now I'm going to measure the size of one of those sunspots on the same scale. That big sunspot, which you can see right here, its diameter is 5 centimeters. And I think I want to start off by saying, how big is that sunspot? Let's start with some of the details that we know. We know the radius of the sun is 700,000 kilometers. So what does that make the diameter of the sun? Is anyone actually with me? I feel like I'm talking to Brandon and no one else. My, my mic was muted. I was answering too. <laughs> well, I guess it's me and you, Brandon. Everybody else is smoking weed or something. I don't know what they're up to. So what do you what do you think? Isn't that 14 million? No, it's uh, times two is 1.4 million, right? Seven times uh, two is 14, but. Yeah. Was, yeah. Right? Okay, so Brandon, do you think you could use dimensional analysis and help me figure out how big a sunspot was? Yeah. Let's, come up, let's come up with a scale factor. Sometimes you can kind of come up with your own conversion factor to figure out useful things on a map. And in our scale factor, 12.7 centimeters, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a prime up there so that we realize it's centimeters on the screen is equal to 1.4 million kilometers. 
So can you suggest a method by which I can calculate the size of one of those sunspots? Um, dimensional analysis. Okay, so how do I begin? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to find the... Uh, uh, Ian, can you think of any method here? Or Dennis? Uh, put the... Um... All right, so I just... So we're trying, we're, how big is the sunspot? I know the right. sunspot is five centimeters, right? Yeah, all right. On the screen. Hmm, you, you wouldn't put the, no. What's the first step in dimensional analysis? Well, first you you put out your, your bars with your units. That's the second step. I think you should start with the first step. We're All kind right. of step one right now. Yeah, so uh, 700,000 kilometers. No, that's not what we're trying to convert. Oh, I know. All right, you, you can go, Brandon. <laughs> you you got to do five you it. You're trying to convert the size of your sunspot, so you have to start with five so, centimeters prime, right? Yeah, times uh, division bar. And now? It would be, you have to do kilometers, right? Sure. So it would be one centimeter on the, no. Yeah, one centimeter on the bottom. One, one centimeter prime, one screen centimeter, right? Yeah. Is what? Uh, is coming. No, wait. No, wait. <laughs> Put, could you just do it? If you followed the rules of dimensional, dimensional analysis, you wouldn't be so confused. You're trying to mess with numbers and units at the same time, which is always the way to lose. So and put kilometers on top. Now you need a conversion factor from screen centimeters to real kilometers. And should, should we do the, the bar two, like the, uh, the multiplication and the Nope, we don't bar? need bar two. We all have right, a conversion um, from screen centimeters to kilometers. All right, so 12.7 yes. on the bottom. Right, and on top? Uh, 1.4 times 10 to the sixth. Okay, punch them up for me. Uh, right. I didn't. Mm. You can do it. I don't, my, I'm, <laughs> What's I don't wrong my with calculator just right here. I mean, you can. Anyone can do it. Five hundred and fifty thousand. Doesn't seem right. Five times one point four exp six divided by twelve point seven. Wow. Doesn't seem right. I don't know if I. Uh, it is, but it's crazy. I was expecting a little bit smaller than that. Hold on, I might have gotten something wrong by it. Oh, I know what I did. Guys, it's not five centimeters, it was five millimeters. I'm such a doof. It was five millimeters. How many centimeters is five millimeters? I got the same number as Brandon too. I know, that's my fault. It should yeah. have been 0.5 centimeters. <laughs> I made it dumb. Calculate it one more time. Uh, 
55,000. Yeah. Kilometers. Is that better or worse? <laughs> How big is the Earth? The Earth's radius is 6,400 kilometers. What's That's... So... Hundred and twenty. Hundred and twenty. Six times two is twelve. Twelve thousand eight hundred. Yeah. Compare this number to the size of my spot. It's five times as big. Yeah. So that sunspot that you see right here. Explain that to me again, Brandon. It's fucking huge. Yeah, that thing is five times the size of Earth. And look at the rest of the sun. So how many, how many Earths can you fit in the sun, then? Um, uh, if you go end to end, quite a bit, right? Mm -hmm. What's 1.4 million divided by 12,800? A hundred. Yeah. A hundred Earths can go right across the sun. That's pretty wild, right? It's ridiculous. The sun's huge. And by the way, do you see how it looks like the sun is rotating slowly? Keep in mind, this is over the course of a couple of hours, guys. It's, it's I like, think it's, like, it's not really rotating slowly, is it? It's rotating a few Earth diameters each hour. It just looks like it's slow because you're looking at this huge ass ball that's 1.4 million kilometers across. You see what I'm saying? Jesus. Okay, here's where it gets even crazier. What if instead of looking at the sun at visible wavelengths, what if instead I tried some different wavelengths? Like if I went into the ultraviolet or even in the X-ray, then I would see some really crazy stuff. Watch this. I'm gonna show you the same length of time, the same day, but instead of showing it to you at indigo wavelengths, I'm gonna to go to 17 nanometers, which is right on the border of uh, ultraviolet and X-ray. This is the same exact block of time that you just saw, and I want you to watch it. Notice that the sun looks totally different at x-rays. You can see all these powerful magnetic fields poking off the sun. You can see huge sheets of plasma spiking up into the uh, outer space. And in a moment, you're about to see a giant eruption of plasma called a solar flare. It's gonna create a big burst of x-rays and shoot, whoa, did you see that? Did you guys see that eruption on the surface of the sun? That thing was probably 10 Earth tall. Earth diameters tall, a huge eruption on the surface of the sun. Aren't solar flares dangerous to Earth somehow? Well, even though this is a very tall jet of plasma, um, it, it's only it's not actually dangerous in the sense that it could roast the Earth or anything, because the density of gas is quite low and it, it can't really harm Earth in that sense. The thing is, it, it emits charged particles called the solar wind. And in high enough densities, they can disable communication satellites. So the big freak out came in the 1980s when a giant solar flare sent such a strong current of electrons to Earth that it basically disabled half of Canada's power grid. And in that sense, it's dangerous having your lights go out, especially if you're, I don't know, operating a defibrillator or some kind of uh, heart monitoring machine on, in a hospital, but they can't, they're not dangerous in the sense that they can blast Earth's atmosphere off or anything silly like that. So, so it basically shoots an EMP off. Yeah, they, that's what they call it, an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse. And they, they, some communication satellites, the International Space Station, people have to be worried about that because it's like, it's kind of like, have you ever had your, your house hit by lightning and then suddenly your, your, compu your computer doesn't work anymore? It's yeah. similar to that. Um, a giant pulse of electricity can, can zap your electronics. Um, because the sun looks so interesting at these wavelengths, let's just look at a couple of other videos because they're kind of dope. So I'm going to zoom in on some of these uh, pictures here. 
Let me see if I can go forward a slide or two. Um, this is pretty wild. I'm going to zoom in on one of those loops. Uh, oh, this is some crazy space music, but we'll skip that part. So here you can see the sun um, probably somewhere uh, in the ultraviolet uh, portion of the spectrum, I'm guessing. And I want us to focus in on one of those loops. These loops of plasma are being pushed around by the magnetic activity, which is sometimes present in the sun. And magnetic field lines tend to kind of interact with plasma in a way where they stick to the plasma. Oh yeah, this is a plasma waterfall that's maybe five or 10 Earths tall. So the magnetic field is just lifting the plasma up off the surface of the sun. And the plasma is kind of dripping back down due to the gravity of the sun and getting sucked back down to the surface. So you're basically looking at a giant uh, 10 Earth tall plasma waterfall. How big was this from a telescope? Like how big is this? From the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Oh damn! Just from that little satellite. That's that's taking all these images. It's produced some totally spellbinding images. They're really cool. Um, here's another image uh, that's pretty wild. It's of something called a coronal mass ejection. Now this is pretty fast. So you got to watch quickly here. Oof. That's a huge eruption of gas. That's probably half the sun's diameter, right? That's like the entire radius of the sun is getting blown off there. Oof. Huge cloud of uh, hot plasma that's coming off the sun. So the sun looks very different if we look at it at different wavelengths. Some wavelengths you see hardly any activity. Other wavelengths you see all these crazy magnetic fields. And that has to do with the different layers of the sun that we're seeing. So let's try to come up with a little model of the different layers of the sun. And I want to talk about each of the, the layers in turn so we can learn about them. So here's a little uh, cartoon model of how the sun can be broken down into different layers. And I've got kind of a lot to say. Oh, sorry. You guys, I didn't share my screen with you. I just want to start off by getting this into your notebooks so that I can refer to the different layers of the sun as we go forward here. We're going to make a sort of uh, analogy with a planet. I don't remember what the slideshow was now. Here we go. We've got some outer layers uh, of the sun called the corona and the chromosphere. These are kind of like the atmosphere of the sun. We've got this surface layer, which is called the photosphere. And then we have our inner layers, the convection zone, the radiation zone, and the nuclear core. And I want us to kind of start by taking those as notes so I can refer to those terms. And then we'll, we'll sort of talk about what happens on each of these layers. So let's do some notes on the six layers of the sun. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a sort of uh, analogy with the atmospheres of planets. The outer two layers are called the corona and the chromosphere. And these can be thought of as sort of like the atmosphere if you made an analogy with planets. I'm going to use ATM as my abbreviation for atmosphere. Um, both of these layers are extremely hot. The corona has a temperature of 1 million Kelvin. The chromosphere has temperatures in the tens of thousands of Kelvin. So they're different in terms of their temperature, but both of them have the same thing in common in terms of what they are made out of. Both the corona and the chromosphere are high temperature, low density plasma
that's heated by magnetic field lines. And I'm gonna have a talk with you guys about how magnetic fields heat plasma. I should probably already talk to you guys, I should probably also talk to you guys about what plasma is. Does anyone in the class know what I mean when I talk about plasma? What is plasma? Isn't it I'm blood plasma, huh? Isn't it like ionized atoms? Yeah, it's the fourth, fourth state of matter, right? Yeah. So, um, plasma. Uh, let me just see if I can. I think this is a pretty good little cartoon here. About as good as it gets anyways. Oh, shoot. Hey, I hate this. Oh, here we go. Can you guys see this here on my screen? If you have a solid, all of the atoms in a, or molecules are kind of locked together in a rigid crystal lattice. When you heat up a solid, it turns into a liquid. That's when all the molecules or atoms kind of float free. In a gas, they can actually lift up and kind of bounce around in a box. And if you continue to heat up a gas, you can separate the electrons from the protons. And then you have a kind of charged gas. Charged gases are more complicated than normal gases. And I'll probably introduce both of them when I talk about the ideal gas law. Um, the next layer of the sun is called the photosphere. The photosphere can be thought of as being like the surface of the sun, but it's not a physical surface uh, in terms of uh, in terms of like a solid, because the sun is basically just a big ball of gas. In some senses, the photosphere is actually quite similar to what you see if you light a big lighter. The gas that makes up the photosphere is about one-tenth the density of the air that's creating this flame. And they glow for roughly the same reason. So the photosphere is, it's basically uh, that layer from which the visible is in this. And in a super, super thin layer compared to the radius of the sun, it's a 50 kilometer thin layer, and it has a key temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin. These are the important facts that you need to know. The photosphere of the sun is the layer that you see when you look up at the sky with your naked eyeballs. Or if you look at it with the Solar Dynamics Observatory. I just wanna go back a few slides and show you a picture here. Here's a, a, a cool little artistic picture that someone takes of a, of a man appearing to hold the sun as a glowing ball in the sky. When you look at the sun like this, that layer that you're seeing there is the photosphere. And seen up close with the Solar Dynamics Observatory, it's the layer that appears very, very uniformly illuminated with only a few sunspots visible as any kind of marking at all. I'll say more about that in a bit. Lastly, we have the interior layers of the sun. Brandon, it looks like you're writing. Uh, yeah, just give me like two seconds. Sure. I'm doing the notes kind of fast today because there's kind of a lot of stuff to talk about. All right, you're good. It makes it less fun, but I'm, I'm covering the grounds that I'm trying to cover here. 
good. Um, the interior layers of the star, the ones that you cannot see directly, are called the convection zone. the radiation zone, and then the central nugget of the star, the nuclear core. And the temperature gets higher and higher and higher as you go from the convection zone to the radiation zone to the nuclear core. The temperature of the convection zone is in the hundreds of thousands of Kelvin the radiation zone gets up to millions of Kelvin, and the central core has the highest temperature of all. It's a key temperature of 15 million Kelvin. That's the temperature at which the hydrogen can undergo fusion, and it is fusion which is powering the radiation or the light that we see from the sun. So this is a kind of quick and dirty summary of the different layers of the sun. So these are your six layers. The corona and the chromosphere are like the atmosphere. The photosphere is like the surface. And then it goes convection zone, radiation zone, nuclear core. Now there's many details for me to share about these layers, but this is kind of your first pass so that you can just kind of vaguely understand how we partition the sun's layers. The, you know, the sun doesn't think of itself as having layers. The sun thinks of itself as a big stupid ball of gas. And at the outside, it's hot. And as you go in towards the center, it's hotter and it's denser. The reason why we have invented layers of the sun is because these layers teach us that energy is being transported in different ways throughout the interior and surface of the star. Because the sun is such a massive ball, there's a lot of complexity in to how it operates. And the way it behaves changes as you go from the inside to the outside. One simple example of that would be at the core of the sun, it's hot enough for nuclear fusion to occur, but it's not hot enough for nuclear fusion to occur at the surface. So right there, you can see that there are different things happening at the different layers of the star. In fact, learning these layers is part of understanding the physics of how a star behaves. Mostly, we're going to want to talk about planets in this class, but it turns out that the types of radiation and particles that the sun emits have affected the planets over time. So being vaguely familiar with how the sun operates is going to be crucial to our understanding of planetary science. Okay, um, I'm going to erase these layers. I hope that you've gotten all that. Let's learn a little bit about how um, gases and other things behave. At some point, I want to talk to you guys about magnetic fields, but I guess we'll get to that when we do get to that. Let me share my screen with you guys again. And let's, let's tiptoe back through the sun. Uh, and <clears throat> let's think about a concept called hydrostatic equilibrium. And sometimes this is introduced to students 
as an idea that it matters a lot both in stars and for gas giants. Why should the sun have a fixed radius? Why should the sun maintain a fixed size in space? Think about it, uh, students. If you can see the sun on your sky, you can see that the sun maintains a fixed radius. But the sun is essentially a ball of gas. And if you put gases into outer space, they don't tend to maintain a fixed shape. They tend to just expand. I mean, think about what you know from watching cool science fiction movies. What happens in Alien when they open the airlock to kill the alien, right? Sucks them out. It sucks them out because all the air is getting sucked out of the spaceship, right? Yes. So why doesn't, if you open a perfume bottle in a room, you can eventually smell the perfume because the molecules drift around. Why don't the atoms of gas just fly away into outer space? Why do they sit there and make the shape, the shape of a ball? Electromagnetism. No. <laughs> that's not the answer. It's because that's how the universe works. <laughs> Jesus just waved his magic wand and the sun doesn't explode, right? Is that how it works? Yep. I don't know. Uh, no, there's got to be a physical reason for it. What would make all these gas molecules stay in one place? Rotation? Not rotation. Rotation actually tends to fling things apart. Fusion. No. Fusion produces the sunlight. I don't know. Dennis, Michaela, you want to guess? You don't want to guess. Gravity. Gravity. Gravitational yes. pull. Yes, yes, you both got it at the same time. It's the self-gravity of the star. And this is a concept called hydrostatic equilibrium. It's the answer to the question, why does the sun maintain a fixed radius? Let's take some notes on this. Question. Why does the sun, a ball of gas, maintain a fixed radius of 700,000 kilometers? The answer is something called hydrostatic equilibrium. This is a buzz concept a buzzword in, in stellar astronomy. Hydrostatic equilibrium is a balance of forces between gravity pulling in and something called thermal pressure pushing out. Thermal pressure is gas pressure. And gas pressure is related to something called the ideal gas law. If you've ever taken a chemistry course, you may have been forced to learn about the ideal gas law. We actually kind of need it for our class, so I'm gonna introduce it again. All right, 
Can I erase here? Um, let's, let's think about some, uh, the ideal gas law. First, we need to relate some concepts. Um, if you have particles in a gas, they kind of look like this. These could be the atoms that are inside the sun. The blue pellets could represent hydrogen atoms and the red pellets could represent helium atoms. And this is the rough mixture of hydrogen to helium that we find inside the sun. The, the atoms are all kind of bouncing around and they're colliding off of one another like a giant came of bumper cars or kind of like a mosh pit. All these atoms are moshing around. And as they collide with each other, they share a bunch of physical properties. One of the properties is temperature, and that's something that you guys have already learned about. Can you guys remind me from your notes what the definition of temperature is when we're dealing with a system of particles? How do we define temperature? Hot. <laughs> Kidding. Huh? I said hot. <laughs> I know, it was a joke. Your experience of heat is not always the same thing as temperature. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of a system of particles. Nice. It's the average kinetic energy of the particles. That's very good. And since kinetic energy is one half mv squared, temperature is kind of like the speed of the particles. That's kind of a lie, but it's kind of the truth at the same time. Now, when we define pressure, pressure refers to something else. It's a related concept, but pressure is the force per unit area that the gas might exert on the walls of a container, like the membrane of a balloon. So typically the picture you have is of a wall. In this case, the wall could be the edge of your box or the rubber membrane of a balloon. And there's a bunch of gas particles smashing into it. And as the gas particles collide off of it, they exert some force per unit area. So there's some force of the, of the molecules punching into the walls of the balloon that keep it expanded. The units of pressure are varied. And you're going to see several different units of pressure in this class because we're going to study planetary atmospheres. In the MKS system, Forces are measured in newtons. Area is measured in square meters. And this is defined as a Pascal. A Pascal is one newton per square meter. How about, um, how about other units of pressure from your everyday life? What do you use when you fill up your tires? That's tire good... pressure. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of noise in the background. What's up? Tire pressure? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> there are no units called tire pressure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. What's the units of it? Uh... Or pumping up a bike tire? Yeah. Air, not air pressure, but... Uh, it's, it's PSI, pounds per square inch. God, that's... I don't know, sometimes people who work in mechanic shops and stuff know this stuff. PSI is pounds per square inch.
Some other units of atmospheric pressure that you're going to see are one atmosphere, which is approximately equal to one bar. Meteorologists tend to measure atmospheric pressure in bars. Planetary scientists tend to measure in units of atmospheres. But the basic idea is that one atmosphere of pressure, the atmosphere that you are under at sea level, is 100 kilopascals, which as you metric lovers know, is 100,000 pascals. And that's also equal to 14.7 pounds per square inch. So the air that you're breathing right now is 14.7 pounds for every square inch. Kind of a lot if you think about it. Can you or, just read um, the word before gas law? Ideal. Thank you. You mean up here? Yeah. Who was just talking to me? Oh, it's Megan. Megan, can you let me know when you're done writing so I can erase? I'm done. I just needed that word. Oh. Oh, you're hiding from me. Who, uh, everyone else good? All right. The ideal gas law is important. If you're going to study the sun, you kind of have to know a little bit about how gases work. OK. The ideal gas law is a relationship between these three quantities. And it goes like this. This is the, this is the mature adult physicist version. You may have learned the ideal gas law in your chemistry class as PV equals NRT. Uh, the kids used to call that pivnert. I don't know if you guys still do. I don't even know if you guys take chemistry anymore. But the physicists, they express the ideal gas law as pressure equals number density times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. So let's label each of these things. P is the pressure measured in units of pascals, which are newtons per square meter. N is something called the number density of the gas. This is how many particles are in your box. And sometimes they just say it's the number of particles per cubic meter. Sometimes people use particles per cubic centimeter too. Sometimes they don't even express the particles. They just say one over cubic centimeters. Um, K is something called the Boltzmann constant. Every day I've got to introduce a new constant to you guys. The Boltzmann constant is related to the properties of gases. And the Boltzmann constant is... A tiny little number, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 23. It's got kind of strange units, joules per Kelvin. And lastly, T is just the temperature in Kelvin.
All right. Um, before we tea break, let's try to understand what the ideal gas law is teaching us. And because I'm feeling a little sleepy and, un, uh, you know, my lectures are a little dull today, I'm going to try to show you with a, a jazzy animated GIF. Uh, check this out. One day I found this gas properties application. It's kind of cute. It kind of relates the three properties of the um, ideal gas law in a, in a cute little form here. So we're going to be measuring the pressure in atmospheres. So that's basically relative to the atmosphere of Earth and the temperature in Kelvin. Let's pump the handle up, shall we? Pump, pump. Here come the gas particles, boop, 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 boop. And they're bouncing around. And you can see two pumps puts us at 300 Kelvin, which is pretty close to room temperature. Room temperature is 300, uh, 293 Kelvin. So this is just like a little bit hotter than room temperature. This might be 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And the, the pressure is about one atmospheric pressure. So that's pretty close to the atmosphere in this room. Now, what do you think would happen to my gas if I added some fire? If I heat up the bottom of the box, what's going to happen to those particles? It's going to move faster. Right? Move faster. Yeah. What will happen to the pressure? It would increase. Yeah, because the bullets will have a higher velocity. So let's do this. Notice that we're increasing the kinetic energy of the particles. The temperature is going bonkers and the pressure is going up the suit. Ooh, let's add some ice. Let's cool it back down. Cooling them gas particles down. Notice they're going slower now. All right. So we're back to about 300 Kelvin and one atmosphere of pressure. What's going to happen to my gas if I take Mr. Robot here and I squeeze the side of the box and I squish the box? It's the particles are going to come closer together. And then what? The pressure is going to go higher. How about the temperature? It'll heat up too. Yeah. This is how a piston works in a car, right? Um, what property of the ideal gas law am I changing when I squeeze the box? Well, first let's squeeze the box. Squeeze! Look pressure. At that. Yeah. You're changing the pressure. Uh, but not directly. The robot is not indirectly changing the pressure, but what, what quantity am I changing? Whoa, I just blew the lid off this thing. When I squeeze the box, what property of the ideal gas law am I changing? The density? The number density. Uh, can you explain that one to me, Dennis? Um, just because you're you're changing you're changing like the area, like the total amount of the box. Uh, the, the volume of the, of the box, right? Yeah, the volume of the box. Like, so like, it changes the density. Um, right, because if I have five particles per box, and I I make the box half as big. Now I've got 10 particles per box, right? Yeah. Because it's ha five particles per half a box. Okay. Here's something. Oh, watch this. Let's give one pump of a heavy species and one pump of a light species. Can you guys see that at the same temperature, the lighter particles are moving faster? They have less mass. So if, if everyone's at the same kinetic energy, the light particles move a bit faster. What do you think would happen if I added some gravity to this bad boy? Because I can adjust the gravity over here on the right. Would the particles move faster? Yeah. Want to see what happens? Watch what happens to the temperature and the pressure. Boom. What happened to the temperature? What happened to the pressure? Well, the pressure stayed the same, but the temperature went up. Yeah, the pressure went up a little bit too. But the problem is there's a gradient of pressure. Watch this. If there's gravity, I can even open the lid of the box and gravity will kind of keep the particles down at the bottom, won't it? I guess yeah. this is kind of like hydrostatic equilibrium, isn't it? 
In hydrostatic equilibrium, the gas has a pressure which makes it want to blow away into space. Occasionally, a couple of light particles can achieve escape velocity. But these heavier particles, they're kind of trapped, aren't they? Let's put some more light particles in and see what happens. Whoa! The light particles can kind of bounce away if they're light enough. But gravity still kind of holds them down. This is actually a very cool animation. Let's add a lot of heavy species. <laughs> it's fun to break things. OK. By the way, when gases get too packed together like they are now, the ideal gas law breaks down. And those gases become a new type of object called the degenerate gas. You know, the gases in the center of the sun are so tightly packed together that the ideal gas law actually breaks down. But for the most part, in a majority of the sun's volume, the sun can be considered to be a ball of gas which obeys the ideal gas law. Um, let's make one last note and then we'll take a tea break. The sun is a mixture of neutral gas which obeys the ideal gas law, that's where you have one proton and one electron, right? And some amounts of plasma. Plasma is a charge gas. And in a charge gas, the protons and the electrons float separate from one another. These gases are more complicated than neutral gases because they have electric fields and magnetic fields which mess with their motions. In fact, if I were to describe the sun, up here at the photosphere, it's like 99% gas and 1% plasma. So the surface of the star is mostly neutral gas. By the time you get to the center of the gas, uh, center of the star, I mean, it's 100% plasma. So as you go down into the belly of the sun, it's getting hotter, and the gases are becoming more ionized. So the, literally, the sun is like gas on the outside and plasma on the inside. It's kind of a two-part model. To learn, of, oh, by the way, here's something weird. Because the chromosphere and the corona are hotter, it's like 100% plasma out here, too. So if the sun was a lollipop, it's an outer layer of plasma, a middle layer of gas, and an inner layer of plasma. It's kind of complicated, actually. Um, it's not quite 100%. I kind of lied there, but I don't know the exact number, so. I'm making it up. All right, why don't you give yourselves a little tea break? Um, let's take some time to have a snack. I think uh, we could probably use that because we're all a little slow today. Sound like a plan? All right, I'm gonna pause. Hello, people. Where's my people at? Okay. My animation is still popping here. I wonder uh, what our options are for lab today. I'm having a thought, a lab thought.
Our next lab up was supposed to be lenses and telescopes. Uh, I'm having a different, a different think about this. I wonder if we should do rotation of the sun today. Yeah. I'm wondering if we can, uh, what's the best way to do this? Add an assignment. I guess we can just call it lab eight. Rotation of the sun. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if it's gonna matter that much to you guys, but I think I'd like to do rotation of the sun first and lenses and telescopes second. Where is this damn thing? If it's a document, I'm just gonna have to like print it out before we do it real quick. Yeah, it, it's a document. Um, I, I hate to just switch things around on you last minute, but I guess I was thinking a couple of different things. If we're gonna do the rotation of the sun lab, it'd be nice to have it coincide with our lecture of the sun. Yeah. Uh, the other issue is I'm kind of tired and crabby today, and I think this will just be a better lab. The other lab on lenses and telescopes I love very much, so I'd like to save that. So this is a short, fun little lab that'll kind of match up with our Sunspot lab. So why don't we go ahead, if you can print this out, Dennis. Do you want me to do it now? Or, be, or are we doing like a little bit of a lecture before? We'll do a little bit of a lecture. So I'd say, do you, can you print it out from the screen you're on or do you have to go to a different computer? I just, I just have to run upstairs real quick. It'd take literally five seconds, less than a minute. So Yeah, go ahead and do it. You can miss a second or two of lecture, I think. All right, um, cool. Hey, uh, do we need the... Because I want to save printer ink. I don't want to print out that sunspot thing. I guess. Oh, we need um, we need this page with the suns. We don't need 13.3, but we need 13.4 with the sunspots. We need 13.5 and 6, unfortunately. Is, is <coughs> wait. Well, hold on, hold on. Um, I'm going to track the sunspots on my page. Do you? So this lab involves tracing paper, and I'm guessing most of you don't have tracing paper, right? Yeah, we don't. If you're worried about ink, then um, don't print that out, and you'll just take the measurements along with me. But print out this page and, and the next page, uh, 13, 5, and 13, 6, okay? Or pages 3 and 4. <clears throat> I'm going to go right. print mine, too, so I might be like a minute or two behind. All right, why don't you print yours now, and I'll get my tracing paper ready, okay? Where do we get that? Uh, you get that on Blackboard. Okay. You go to Blackboard, go to Lab, and then go to Lab 8, Rotation of the Sun. It should be there now. Are we not, are we not doing Lab 7? Uh, we'll do Lab 7 on uh, Wednesday. We're All just right. going to reverse the order, if that's cool. All right. I have to go print it, so I'll be right back. Um, I'm going to be tracking some sunspots with this tracing paper. So if you have tracing paper, that would be cool. If not, that's fine. I'll take a minute to clean my board with Windex. Nobody's around.
<laughs> so which uh, papers would you like us to print, Professor? Because I got the last two. The last two is fine. <clears throat> I guess if you don't have tracing paper, uh, it will be hard to trace the sunspots. actually worked out because I got to clean my board here. Is everyone back? All right. Um, before we stopped, we learned a little bit about, uh, we learned a teensy bit about um, the sun and gases and plasmas. And now we're going to try to take a look and understand how this can lead to some of the different types of phenomenon that we see at the surface of the sun. So I want to show you guys a couple of cool videos from an older, uh, an older satellite that used to image the sun. Today, of course, the Solar Dynamics Observatory is the, uh, is the sort of top tier satellite that's used for solar imaging and produce many of the cool videos and pictures that you see. But once upon a time, there was a satellite called TRACE. And the TRACE satellite had some really cool uh, videos of, of some sort of classic phenomenon that we see at the surface of the sun. One of them is called a solar flare. And I'd like to show that to you here. So I'm going to VLC and see what happens. All right. So here you can see um, the surface of the sun. I want to point some things out. Notice that the Earth to scale is the size of this white disk here. And I'm going to hit play, and I want you to watch what happens. This is what's called a solar flare. A solar flare is a massive eruption that sends a burst of plasma and gas into space. Uh, but then it doesn't quite achieve escape velocity. So the gravity sucks it right back down onto the surface of the sun. And some of these uh, solar flares can be really brilliant and dramatic. Um, I'm sure if we went to the greatest hits uh, on the trace satellite, sorry, or on, um, we could see some mind, mind blowing images of solar flares. Um, well, of course, the, the Solar Dynamics Observatory catches them in, in much greater resolution at a variety of different wavelengths. Let's see if we can see one here. Boom. Did you see that? Those are massive and very intense solar flares. Sometimes we even see these things called coronal mass ejections. And I'd like to show you a video of a coronal mass ejection. Okay, let's try this again. So here's the Earth to scale, and you're going to see a powerful magnetic field kind of twist around and send a burst of gas into space. So look at that. It's this massive eruption shooting gas and plasma into space. And a few moments after the eruption, you can see some static strike the screen of your camera. So we have solar flares, and we have these other things called coronal mass ejections. All of these are related to the potent magnetic field activity 
that we saw at the surface of the sun in one of my earlier slideshows. Remember that when you look at the sun, <clears throat> function F5, while the surface of the sun looks like a steady uniform light, if you look at the sun in x-rays, you see all of these different sorts of crazy activity. You see these wild looking magnetic fields. And I wanna start off by kind of introducing to you guys how the magnetic fields of the sun develop. And it's also a kind of a cute opportunity to talk to you about where magnetic fields come from. So let's kind of look at a classic physics textbook picture of where magnetic fields come from. You guys are mostly familiar with the sort of bar magnets that you, you find in a toy shop or maybe uh, stuck to your refrigerator. But in a classic physics sense, the way you generate a magnetic field is just by sending a current of electricity, a current of electrons down a wire. And when you do so, the moving charges pushing the electrons forward creates a sort of circular patterned magnetic field. So, oops, uh, what I'm gonna do with you guys is we're gonna come up with three rules for magnetic fields that you can take away with you as notes. Now these rules for magnetic fields are ones that I just kind of made up and they're sort of designed to sort of summarize an entire electricity and magnetism course for you. Not that you could do that with three simple statements, but it's a stab at it anyways. And the first rule is that moving charges create magnetic fields. So usually the typical case is you have a wire. The wire has some copper atoms in it, perhaps. There's a bunch of electrons dangling at the edge of your copper atoms. Those are known as the valence electron. Usually in a copper atom, the 26th electron, the very last electron, is just kind of weakly dangling from the atom. And if you send a current of electricity through it, if you generate a current, then a magnetic field will form in a circular shape surrounding your wire. Here's an interesting thing. What if I were to take a wire and attach it to a battery, and then using a pair of needle nose pliers, I were to bend, I would to bend that wire into an almost perfect circle so that the electrons were flowing around in a circle almost if you neglect this wire part. In that case, the magnetic field would take on a very classic shape, kind of looks like a set of bunny ears and it's called a dipole magnetic field. Dipole magnetic fields happen when currents travel in a circle. And there are many examples of them in nature, including the Earth's dipole magnetic field. The implication of course, is that somewhere deep inside the Earth, there are a bunch of charged electrons which are circulating around as the Earth sloshes around in its 24-hour axis spin, and the circulating charges deep down in the interior of Earth are what's generating this magnetic field. Now, once we create magnetic fields, we have another problem. Other charges like protons and electrons can stick to these magnetic fields. Other charges, not the ones that created the magnetic fields, but the ones that come along later, they stick to magnetic fields. And when they stick to the magnetic fields, <clears throat> they often undergo a dramatic slowing down that results in the emission of a photon. And this is kind of an elaborate way to produce photons it's what the Germans call Bremsstrahlung radiation. Bremsstrahlung radiation is a special type of X-ray that's produced when electrons strike magnetic fields. So Bremsstrahlung is German for breaking radiation. Basically, uh, what happens is you have some kind of a magnetic field 
a high-speed electron comes careening towards your magnetic field line. And when it hits the magnetic field, it gets stopped or stuck to it. And as a result, it shoots off a very short wavelength and very high energy X-ray. Basically, the loss of energy that the, collect, that the electron feels when it, it, it slaps into the magnetic field, it sort of hits this thing, gets emitted as an X-ray. And this is the idea behind Bremsstrahlung radiation. Now, why am I telling you about this obscure type of physics reaction between charged particles and magnetic fields? <laughs> There's some breaking things happening around my apartment, actually. <laughs> All right. Anyways, um, let's show it. Look, let's look at a little animated GIF of how that how that works. Okay. Um, in my physics Java apps, I can kind of demonstrate this by using the radiating charge application. Where is it here? Physics Java apps. Radiating charge. Yeah. Now, this was not designed to show us Brems. What the? This wasn't designed to demonstrate Brems to lung, but you can kind of cheat and get it to. Brems to lung can happen either with protons or electrons. Let's give this thing some linear velocity. And what you're seeing here is the electric field. Unfortunately, this, this animation will not show you the magnetic field, but it would have been way effing cooler if it did. And although I can't show you the magnetic field line, I guess I could try drawing it. There's your magnetic field line. Let's watch what happens when the proton is going to hit the magnetic field line. So watch this. It comes towards the magnetic field line, do 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 do, and boom, it stops. And did you see that little kink in the electric field? That's the emission of your very short wavelength uh, X-ray. Let's try that again. Boop. It hits the magnetic field, and now. The reason, of course, why this is important is because um, normally you cannot see magnetic field lines. But the reason you can see the magnetic fields poking out of the surface of the sun is because zillions upon zillions of protons and electrons are striking these magnetic fields and they're emitting x-rays out towards the observatory, towards the Solar Dynamics Observatory, where they're captured by an x-ray detector. Let's go ahead and look at another real-time image of x-ray emission on the surface of the sun. Where do you guys see the greatest intensity of x-rays in this video? <clears throat> Where's the x-ray emission the brightest? Would it be um, on like the left side and on the right side? Uh, yes, uh, I, but I was thinking like you can see it here. And then like right there on the left and then the center right there where you just circled. Yeah, like right it's, there. It's kind of wherever the magnetic field lines are strongest. Like if your magnetic field looks like this, the magnetic field lines tend to kind of bunch up really close to the uh, lower parts of the corona. By the way, you're looking at the upper atmosphere of the sun in this picture. This picture is showing you only the corona. What, the, the photosphere is called the surface. What color is the surface of the sun in this video class? What color is the surface of the sun? Like a burnt orange? Well, the colors are getting kind of wigged out over the inter it's um they're supposed to they're not a burnt orange they're they're black. The photosphere is black. Does it look orange on your screen? I mean it i i I can see it's black, but it's like I don't know from like from this, this stuff is yellow, yeah, that's yeah, it's just like a black green, layered with like a yellow tint type thing. yeah, that's why it's yeah. right. But but the point is what you're supposed to see is that the lower layers, the surface, the photosphere of the sun, 
it doesn't produce any x-rays because it's producing light by thermal or black body radiation. But this type of radiation that you see up here, this is non-thermal radiation. It's not black body radiation. It's closer to like emission lines. So sometimes we say this, when, when magnetic fields create x-rays, we call it non-thermal radiation. In other words, to put it in cartoon phrases, it's not, I glow because I'm hot. It's, I glow because I just got whipped in the face with a magnetic field, if that makes any sense. So what happens is along come little protons and electrons, and when they grab those magnetic fields, they kind of get stuck to them. They gyrate around in a little circle, emitting x-rays as they go. Now, in that sense, you can think of magnetic fields as being like flypaper, and the electrons and protons are like flies getting stuck to it. Although I suppose if you had a big enough wad of flies, you could actually stick flypaper to flies instead of the other way around. That's our third rule. The third rule is, Magnetic fields get, um, or they stick to or they even get twisted by bulk charges or plasma. Bulk charges is just another way of saying plasma. This is how the magnetic field activity of the sun gets so incredibly messed up. So, here we can imagine the sun as a giant rotating ball of plasma. One of the interesting things about the sun is that the sun is not a solid surface like Earth. It's a giant rotating goopy ball of tapioca pudding. And because of that, it does not have to rotate at the same rate, nor does it. You can see from this illustration that the equator of the sun completes a rotation in every 25 days but the poles of the sun complete a rotation in 35 days. So literally the equator is rotating faster than the poles. And over time, this is gonna drag along the magnetic field lines with it. So here you can see at first, we're trying to generate a nice simple dipole magnetic field. But as the, as the sun rotates with the equator faster than the poles, the magnetic field lines start to get twisted up by the rotation. And after several rotations, the magnetic fields will even poke sideways out of the surface of the sun. And pretty soon the sun starts to look like this stuff down here. Plasma gets stuck to those magnetic field lines and starts giving off little x-rays as a mission. So literally the rotation of the sun actually creates these twisted up magnetic field lines. And it turns out, believe it or not, that the magnetic fields are actually related to the sunspots at the surface. So sunspots are also regions of plasma that are getting trapped by magnetic fields, but they're getting trapped a little further down. They're getting trapped kind of closer to the photosphere near the surface. So sunspots are kind of cool. Um, we can say a couple of things about them. Let's look at a couple of pictures and then I'll have you take some notes. Let me fly ahead here to my sunspot lesson. So sunspots occur at the base of the magnetic fields. And what happens with the sunspots is you get a region of gas at the surface of the sun that is shining away visible light, and as it shines away visible light, it's getting cooler and cooler. Normally, the gas will sink back down into the star and get reheated. But in this case, that process of convection gets blocked, 
and you basically trap a big blob of gas at the surface of the star where it keeps shining and shining and shining and shining away its light until eventually the gas starts to get cooler compared to its surrounding regions. And interestingly enough, we always find sunspots in pairs because we always find sunspots at the base of magnetic fields. So there'll be a spot here and there'll be a spot there. They usually come in pairs. Here's a picture of a sunspot pair. And you can see that relative to the surrounding bubbly photosphere, the sunspot is actually quite dark, or at least it seems dark by contrast. Another cool thing about sunspots, as you're going to discover in your lab today, is we can track their spin around the sun to measure the rotation of the sun. Interestingly enough, sunspots come and go with a period of 11 years. And it turns out that they're connected to the magnetic activity of the sun. The sun has an 11 year cycle where for about five and a half years, the sun gets really magnetically active and produces a ton of sunspots. And then for five years, the sun gets magnetically quiet and produces no sunspots. And this period has been going back and forth. Five years of sunspots, five years of no spots, five years of sunspots, five years of no spots. With the exception of this weird, creepy period from 1650 to 1700, there was a break in sunspot activity. It's something called the Maunder Minimum. And we think it may even have connections with climate change on Earth. <clears throat> Not that climate change is being caused by the lack of sunspot activity. Today's climate change is man-made. But there are strange connections between magnetic activity on the sun and slight changes in climate on Earth. Ah, uh, let's clear that. Um, let's do a little sunspot investigation by taking some notes on sunspots and then trying to analyze how does the light that comes from this region here compare to the region of light that comes from that region there on the photosphere. basic notes on sunspots since they're the point of our lab today. Sunspots are regions of cooler gas and plasma that have been trapped by magnetic fields at the photosphere. Uh, typical temperatures of a spot might be around 4,000 Kelvin. And that's versus the normal photosphere of 5,800 Kelvin. They come in pairs. And they are related to the 11 year solar magnetic cycle. We are currently in our uh, current phase of the solar magnetic cycle at an extreme minimum where there is absolutely no sunspot activity on the sun. I actually have a telescope here with a solar filter, and I'm tempted to show it the surface of the sun to you, but it just kind of looks like a single disc of orange. It's not super interesting. <clears throat> Let's do a sunspot comparison. Let's compare a spot, which has been trapped by magnetic field lines, so I'll I'll draw my magnetic fields here, okay? And let's compare the amount of light given off by a sunspot to other parts of the sun 
the so-called photosphere, which is itself giving off light. I want to ask two questions, which I'll put up here. Question one, how much more light is emitted by a normal patch of photosphere compared to a spot? So that's my first question. And the second question is going to be to compare the peak wavelength emitted. Class, which formula could I use to solve question one? What formula from our class can I use to, to answer the first question? I'm looking for a quantity of light emitted. <clears throat> what formula tells us the quantity of light emitted based on its temperature? Wouldn't it be like B equals sigma, I think that's what it is, times temperature to the fourth? That's very great, yeah. So the brightness of a spot is equal to sigma t to the fourth. Now, we calculated the brightness of the photosphere earlier, and we got, uh, I believe, 65 million watts per meter squared. But in this case, I don't think it makes sense to actually calculate the brightness of the spot and then divide the two. I think we should divide them up front the way we did in our homework today. So we'll divide the brightness of the photosphere divided by the brightness of a spot, sigma times the temperature to the fourth power of the photosphere over sigma times the temperature of the spot leads to the ratio of temperatures raised to the power of four. And plugging in the numbers, 5,800 Kelvin over 4,000 Kelvin Raised to the fourth power gives us what? Equals 1.45 to the power of four. What do you get? Uh, 4.420. Let's just call it four. Four times more. Another way to put this is that 
the spot is four times dimmer compared to the photosphere. What if I compare their peak wavelengths? Now, if you use lambda max, it's 3 million nanometer kelvins over 5,800 kelvin, you get 520 nanometers, which is green. What do you get for a sunspot? My mic was muted. 750 nanometers. What part of the electromagnetic spectrum is that? Red, right? Uh, red and infrared. It's right in the boundary. Yeah. OK. Here's my big thought question. question that astronomers always ask their students. What if the sun was covered in one big giant sunspot? What would the sun look like from Earth? If the sun was covered in one humongous giant sunspot? So red. Uh... Be orange, or like huh? orange, because it wouldn't be red because of the atmosphere, right? It looks so. He looks yellowy because of the atmosphere. So keep going. Would it be green? No, clearly not. <laughs> what if this was all four thousand Kelvin? So you said the sunspots, right? They 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 heat up like every like eleven or something years, and then they no cool no don't down, say heat right? up. They're actually cooler. They cool down, so well, that means the magnetic fields show up every eleven years or every five oh. years, and oh. the magnetic fields create sticky regions of plasma that cool off. So wouldn't they be less visible? Well. I'm just asking what would happen if the sun was covered in a giant sheet of plasma that was 4,000 Kelvin. Another way to ask the question I'm trying to ask is why are sunspots black? Because they're cooler. Yeah. The, 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 it's the less temperature. So keep going with that. Um, so... Uh, on the spectrum of light, um, <laughs> wrong? Electromagnetic spectrum, okay. On the electromagnetic spectrum, um, we don't, it's, it's different on the electromagnetic spectrum, what we see with our eyes. Well, look, I don't know. I'm asking you to compare that. two black body curves. Yeah. Our sun peaks right around the center of the visible spectrum. Yeah. So our sun gives off a lot more green light than it does either red light or blue light. But when you mix them all together from space, they look kind of white. But a sunspot's closer to 4,000 Kelvin. It emits more red light than blue light, but it still does emit a lot of both.
if the sun was the color of a sunspot, it would probably still look, it would look like a slightly redder sun on our sky. Instead of it being yellow, it would be a little orangey. But from space, it would probably still look white. The sunspots are only looking black because they're black by contrast. It's a photography issue. If your camera is exposed for the brightest object in the frame, which is the photosphere, these are gonna look black in comparison because they're giving out four times less light. And they look dark by comparison to your eyes. But in fact, these are still bright regions of gas. They're just not quite as bright as the regions up here. I don't know, something to think about. I have about. no idea. <laughs> well, the idea is that sunspots are still hot gas and they are still glowing. Just because they're black doesn't mean they're not giving off any light. They only look black as a contrast issue, you know? If you tried to expose the sunspots, the photosphere would overexpose the photograph and blow out the image. Okay. Um, as you saw in the first part of our lecture, sometimes these spots can be like multiple times the size of Earth. Now, I'll just talk to you briefly about the inner layers of the sun and then we'll do our sunspots lab. Uh, the photosphere of the sun is the business end. It's the end that you see. And it's a quite thin layer that's so thin in comparison to the rest of the sun that the, the layer that produces the visible light, sorry, you're not seeing my share screen here. The layer that produces the visible light is so thin that all the light seems to come from almost like a candy coated surface. But that, that candy-coated surface is just a layer of very thin gas that's producing all the visible light. As you go into the deeper layers of the sun, you get to layers that we cannot directly observe with our telescopes, but we have to analyze them through modeling. And there's kind of three different areas. There's a convection zone where gas is transported in the form of big bubbles that rise up and sink down. Basically here, the gas is turbulent and hot blobs rise up to the photosphere and cool blobs sink back down towards the inner layers of the sun. You can basically imagine the photos, uh, sorry, the convection zone is a gigantic lava lamp with hot bubbles rising and cool bubbles sinking. But once you get past a certain radius, once you get into a certain layer of the sun, the gas becomes completely plasma and at that point, it doesn't travel by bubbles, but it actually just takes light that ricochets off the plasma and scatters its way through. Eventually, you get down into the inner core of the star where nuclear fusion can take place. And in the inner core of the star, you're basically taking your four hydrogen atoms, your four protons, and smashing them together into a set of collisions to produce both helium nuclei and gamma rays. And this is the nuclear fusion that powers the inner core of the sun. So let's just take some very last minute notes because I probably won't get to come back to this on the inner layers of the sun. In the inner layers of the sun, we have the convection zone. And here, energy is transported by a process called convection. And for lack of a better time to describe it, convection basically means hot blobs rise, and cool blobs sink. And once again, you can think of this as being similar to a lava lamp.
in the radiation zone, energy is being transported by radiation. The gas is quite dense inside the radiation zone. So what that means is photons basically bounce off plasma particles. In some ways, the radiation zone sort of resembles a pinball game. Where the photons are like the steel ball bearings, the pinballs, and the plasma particles are like the bumpers that they bounce off of on their journey through the star. In the inner core of the star, we actually produce energy. Energy is produced by nuclear fusion. I'll save description of nuclear energy for a different day, but I'll just say it's powered by nuclear fusion where four hydrogens slam together to make one helium and two gamma ray photons. So all the energy of sunlight begins its journey through the star, not in the form of visible or infrared or X-ray photons, but all the light of the star is, begins its journey by super, super short wavelength gamma rays. That's the kind of stuff that comes out of nuclear reactions. Why don't the gamma rays make it all the way to the surface? Because as they pinball their way through the star, they transport energy to the particles and lose energy, changing their wavelength to X-ray photons and visible photons and infrared photons. Eventually, what comes out of the upper layer, the photosphere, is a pure uh, black body radiation field. OK, that was a lot of notes. Um, I knew this would be the only day I could talk to you about the sun, so I just kind of jammed it all in there. It wasn't very pretty. I'll probably try not to do something like that again. Uh, now that it's 2.57, I think we should switch over to lab mode. And if everyone's good to go, we're going to try to uh, conduct our sunspot lab. So let me get set up for that. Hold on. Does anyone need an extra minute on the notes here? Or are you guys all good? Ian, are you good? All right, then I guess everybody's good. Okay, let me see uh, what I can do here. Um, 
going to use this piece of tracing paper, although I, it had a weird pencil mark on it. Piece of tracing paper. We're going to attempt to track some sunspots across the sun, something like this. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, if you want to follow along completely, you're going to want your tracing paper with those sunspots. I have an extra copy of that floating around. Let me see if I can also print out. To do this lab right, it's going to be helpful to have a ruler and a protractor and a compass. Um, let's see if I can, I should have hit print at the same time you guys were hinting print. I have no idea why I did. I thought I would actually be okay, but. So if we have this sheet, we're, uh, we're cool. Uh, no, you, the sheets you're going to turn into 13, five and 13, six. That I, one. I, I have all the sheets printed up, but. Yeah, all right, cool. Sorry, maybe I didn't make that very clear. I'm just going to print out pages three to four. Let's see what happens here. Let's see if I... Hold on a second. Ever since this puppy got unplugged, it's been acting cranky. Let me try that one more time. Okay, let's try something different. Let's try my backup printer. Three dash four. Just a second, guys. Let me go to the PDF, see if that changes everything. Sorry, it's being, everything's being cranky here today. All right, that seemed to work. Don't ask me what the hell that was all about.
Come on, baby. It printed out the whole damn thing by accident. Uh, can someone mute in the background there? Seems to be a little bit of activity. Zach, I think that's you. Thank you. I'm sorry, guys. I'm having some real trouble here. I don't understand why it printed out the first two and not the rest of them. Oh, 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 I see why. This is, all right, fuck. Oh no. Oh shit. Okay. Five, six. God damn it. All right, I'm a bonehead. A double bonehead. All right, get it. This is page six. It's, it's printing. All right. Well, I eventually got it. Sorry, guys. Things are moving a little slow in my brain here today. All right, let's begin. The goal today, friends, uh, are we still recording? Yes, okay. The goal today is for us to measure the rotation of the sun by tracking some sunspots across the surface. And we're gonna be doing this by tracking a set of spots. Let's see if I can get my phone in action here. Do you guys remember what the answer is going to be? Does anyone remember what the rotation of the sun's equator is from our, uh, our lecture? Come on, you stupid. always acting up. Sorry, this as usual, a million glitches here in my operation. Ah. All right, I think I've got to reset my phone as always. Um, the the uh, average rotation of the sun along the equator is around 25 days. That's the goal we're going to be looking for. 
And we're gonna see if we can get that by just tracking the motions of spots across the surface. Now our goal is to pick uh, one spot that drifts across the northern hemisphere. That will be called our A spot. And another spot that drifts across the southern hemisphere, that's gonna be our B spot. And while I'm waiting for my stupid phone to figure itself out, I'll start by showing you the spots that I think we should track. Now on the page here, we're gonna to try to follow a spot uh, as it goes across the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere. And they can be a little bit tough to track your first time around. Uh, let me just scroll up here to the first day. Um, the spot that I'd like to get is this really dark one here. And if you look at these little two next to it, that's the same as, uh, oops, excuse me, not that one. This spot here is that spot there. Let me try that again. This spot on 727 rotates to that spot, which then rotates to that spot, and then that spot, and then that spot. So that's the B spot that we're gonna track five observations across our southern hemisphere. Um, you can tell it's the same spot because it's big and because you can see these two spots here in each of the frames. So here I can see the two spots, the two spots, the two spots. We're not gonna track all of them. We're just gonna track this B spot. And then down here in the lower half, we're gonna track a Northern hemisphere spot using some tracing paper. We're gonna track so this guy is the same as that guy, is the same as that guy, that guy, that guy, and that guy. So those are the spots that we're gonna track here. Let's see if I can get my phone going so that we can track these appropriately. Hopefully it'll work this time. Come on, baby. Uh. No, we, can't. we cannot have this nonsense. It's extremely frustrating because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and I never know what to expect. I was hoping maybe my iPad would work. Yeah, I might need to. I don't know why this thing is such a crappy puke. Okay. Uh, usually if I just restart the thing once, that's enough. Maybe because yours is newer. Can I try your phone? Sorry guys, this is gonna be hard to do without the phone. So annoying. Normally if I reset it once, that's enough, but not today apparently. Apparently today it's gonna to give me more trouble because I'm just having that kind of a day. I'm gonna try mine one more time. I honestly like mine because it's so small that it's easy to hold, but uh, come on guys, just stick with me here. Well, let me try it one more time. I got nothing. 
Do you have Zoom? Ah, oh, what the fuck? Okay, damn it. All right, well, thank you. Uh, can you make the camera thing happen? Okay, thank you. All right. Here we go. Uh, let me find a pencil here in the drawer. Uh, a pencil. Let me make it sharp. All right. And remind me to keep tapping this. So we're going to track, uh, let's see, this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot, and that spot. And to do it, we're going to need to make a model of our sun on this tracing paper here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a measurement of my first sun and I'm going to measure it in millimeters. What would you guys say is the measurement of that disk of the sun in millimeters? How many millimeters across is that, guys? 52 millimeters. Excellent. And half of 52 millimeters is what? Twenty-six. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a line somewhere on my page. That's that's 26 millimeters. Let's see if I can kind of hold the, the phone and do this here. So I need to kind of clamp this ruler down and hold the phone. Luckily, this thing has good zoom focus. So there is zero millimeters, and 26 is right about there. That's going to be the radius of my circle, 26 millimeters. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my compass and set my compass equal to that radius, right about there. I even like to give a little swipe to test. OK. That's decent. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my tracing paper underneath all this stuff. And I'm going to draw a circle that's 26 millimeters in radius. To do that, you'll notice I kind of lean and spin. I'm going to go over it a few times so it gets nice and dark. All right. Let's see if I did that kind of hasty. Let's see if it came out any good. Oh, ho, ho. How about that, huh? This is why they pay me the big bucks. I'm a good circle maker right there. Now, um, what we need to do before we can start tracking spots is the spots drift and it's really easy to shift your orientation. So we have to first trace over some registration tick marks here. Now, if you had tracing paper, you could follow me along at home, but I'm guessing most of you don't. And even if you did, you wouldn't admit it because you don't feel like doing any of this. I know how it goes. You can just watch me do it, okay? So let's just make some registration tick marks. One, two, Three, four, and this is north and this is east. I'm going to line those up every time I measure a spot, okay? So what we're going to do is we're just going to track the sunspots. I'm going to line up my registration ticks, okay? And I'm going to track my first spot. I'll put the date underneath it. 727. And now I'll track my second spot. Obviously, this lab's a lot cooler when I make you guys do it. But, you know, it's kind of fun for me to do these labs because I haven't. Oh, I made a whoopsie. Does anyone see the whoopsie that I made? I bet you don't. I tracked the wrong spot. Look what I did. See how easy it is to screw this up? Do you guys see those two? And then the spot, look at the pattern. Those two, and then the spot. 
I tracked the wrong damn spot. So I'm going to fix that by erasing the first spot. Keep the date there. And I'll get my registration tick marks again. And now I'll track the right spot, which is right at the edge. Okay. Registration tick marks. Sorry guys, it's actually quite difficult to hold the phone, the tracing paper, and your pencil at the same time. Okay, that one is on 730. So this is actually 727 and What a mess. Normally I like to do this a lot neater, but I'm having a bad day. Okay, 7.30, there it is. Let's do our next one, which is gonna be on 8-1. It's our third spot, 8-1. Get a fourth spot. That's eight, three. Oh, that helps. That's eight dash three. Let me get my last spot right here. That's eight six. All right. Well, it's uh one of the reasons I like my phone a little better is I can hold it in that holder, but this this is a newer phone, so it's much bigger. It's harder to to manipulate. Unfortunately, this is the one that's working today, so. Okay, now we're gonna track our A spot. It turned out to be a good idea to circle those because I easily got confused. So there's that spot, there's that spot, that turns into that spot. It's basically the big dark one that you see in the bottom half. So that's six observations. First, I'm gonna line up my registration ticks north, south, east, and west so that I don't drift too much. And this time to speed things up, I'm gonna track the spots and then I'm gonna put the dates on them afterwards. You know, part of the fun of lab is you're supposed to kind of do something. You guys really aren't doing anything, but I guess you're just trolling. You're just watching. That's what that's what internet life is. It's just trolling the sunspot tracker. Who is me? All right, there you go. There's another sunspot. And then our very last one. Okay, and now, thank God I've got this big work area. You know, it's nice to have a big work desk, just a place where you can do your stuff. It's very important. Um, let's see, we have 8, 8, 
8, 10, 8, 12, 8, 14, 8, 16, 8, 18. So make sure I don't do anything stupid here. This is 8, 8. 8, 10, 8, 12, 8, 14, 8, 16, and 8, 18. I've dated my spots. You all see this? So do we put that on uh, spot A in the side? No. Um, that's coming. All right. This is a part that I would have liked you to do at home with tracing paper or even with a normal piece of paper, but uh, right. I don't know if you have a compass or basically right. you could try to sketch this. I've got an idea. Why doesn't everyone take a screenshot of this? And maybe try to sketch it out freehand if you can. All right. Oh, can you put it back up for a sec? Yep. yep. Come on, let me get my lighting nice. Yeah. Hold on. Good. I'm good. What I want to do next is I want to track two of my spots across the surface. I wonder, can I turn this? Oh, there is no lock. So if I do this, I'm expecting my, come on, stupid. Normally, this thing twists with it. Why are you so stupid? Okay, well, normally, you guys know what I'm talking about. If I twist it sideways, my phone is going sideways, but for some reason, the, the share screen is not. Well, hell, I'll just have to hold it carefully. I'm gonna take my ruler and I'm gonna draw a best fit line. I'm gonna call the top row my A spot. The bottom row is my B spot. And I'm gonna try to make a best fit line that goes sort of through the center of the points. There's my A spot best fit line. You want to try to make the line horizontal. There's my B spot best fit line. So what we're going to do guys is we're going to imagine that we're basically taking a slice through the sun at these two latitudes. And this is a sideways view showing us how far the spot is rotating each couple of days. Now you might think, well, couldn't I just wait until the spot rotates all the way around the sun and that's how I'll measure the rotation? It's not so easy. You guys can see that it gets a little bit confusing even when you're looking at the spot day after day. As soon as those spots go around the limb or the edge of the sun, you've totally lost track of which is which and you're not gonna find them again. So what we want to do is we want to make a top-down view of the sun. So imagine this is in 3D. 
we're going to kind of slice through the sun at some latitude and we're going to try to figure out how many degrees is a spot rotating each day. Like if it rotates from here over to here in a day, how many degrees is that? And that's going to help us figure out the rotation of the sun. So now, uh, Dennis, it's time to go to that spot that we see here where it says spot A. For spot A, we're going to want to measure the length of this line and transfer that line just to the right of spot A. And here's where you guys should sort of pick up and start playing along. If you have a ruler, first watch my measurement, and then you're going to try to make a line of exactly the same length. It really helped to have a ruler here. So how many millimeters across would you say that, that line is? Uh, 50. Yeah, pretty darn close to 50. So I'm going to make a line that's exactly 50 uh, millimeters long on this page. Now the midpoint of 50 is obviously 25. I'm going to mark that with a vertical cross so that I don't confuse it with a sunspot. Then I'm going to try to draw in a hemisphere, a semicircle, by adjusting my compass to 25 centimeters. Oh, shit. This is, hold on. Oh, where's the damned, uh, the tape here? <laughs> Jam this phone right into the tape. Okay, and now I can have both hands free. Oops. It helps to have a little bit of padding when you use your compass. Now you guys are gonna have to draw this in freehand because I'm guessing you don't have a compass. If you do, you can try to do it right. It's supposed to be more fun to do it right. I don't know. I don't know if you guys will actually think that's fun. Let's do the same thing for spot B now. I'm trying to get this phone at just the right angle. Okay, here we go. So let's take spot B. Let's measure the length of that line in centimeters. Let's see if we can zoom in here. Can you guys see that? Yeah, it's about 48. Yeah, fully agree. Thanks, Dennis. So I'm going to make that line 48. And what's the midpoint of 48? 24. That's right. So I'm going to make a vertical cross nice and neat and careful right at 24. Okay. Now I'm going to set my compass again. I'm going to adjust my compass. Just going to bring it in by a millimeter. And I'll try to draw in. Last time I had better luck. All right. So these are supposed to represent top down projections of the sun. Now I got to transfer my spots onto this paper. And at some point I kind of figured out a sort of uh, a neat and fast way to do this. I'm going to put my, my page on top of some padding. You'll notice I've got a little notebook here. I need something kind of soft and smushy so I can poke holes into it. And I'm just going to lay my A spot line right down on top of my, my top-down model. And I'm going to take my compass and I'm going to poke through at the holes so that I can sort of quickly transfer the spots to the line. So take that pointy sharp end of your compass, the one that you don't want to poke yourself with. And this is kind of fun. Just poke through. You just go dink, dink, 
think, 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 all right? And now you can actually see the indentations that I made with the little dinks, right? And what I can do is I can sort of fill in the spots and then put the dates there. Notice that I biased the spots towards the line, even if they weren't exactly on the line. So this was uh, eight, eight. This one was uh, eight, 10, uh, eight, 12. Eight fourteen, eight sixteen, and eight eighteen. Okay. So I hope I'm not going too fast for you guys. You, you staying with me here? Is it okay if it's not exact? Like. Yeah, I understand that you guys might be free freewheeling it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I'm kind of. <laughs> I know, but try to try to. The neater you can be, the better, you know? Yeah. If you have a ruler, that can add to it, you know? All right. Let's try to poke through for our B spots now. So when I lay my B spot line, it seems to match up. That's good. Pretty good agreement there. And I'm just going to sort of sort of poke through. Dink, 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 dink. Let's put our dates on here. So we have, uh, let's see, 727, 730. This is 730. Oops, not 38, but 30. Let's get my pink panther out there, all right? 7.30, all right? This, uh, this guy here is 8-1. I'm gonna kind of shade them in a bit. This one is 8-3. This one is 8 dash six. Hey, just out of curiosity, um, when I'm sharing my screen, I see the little iPhone rectangle and on the outside I can see my sunspots. What do you guys see outside the rectangle? Is it your own screen or do you see something else? What do you mean? We don't see anything. It's just like we can see. Look, I see the rectangle, but I can see the rest of my computer screen. What do you guys see outside this rectangle? I'm just curious. All we see is the rectangle. Oh, the rest is black? Yeah. Weird. OK. All right. <clears throat> All right. What we're going to do now is for each sunspot, a and B, we're gonna track two of our spots up to the surface so that we can see um, how many degrees they rotate per day. We don't wanna be too close to the center or the angle will be small, but we don't wanna be too close to the edge like this or there'll be a lot of uncertainty at what point on the sun's surface it's striking. So I'm going to kind of just go with the 810 spot and the 816 spot because they're kind of in the middle on either side of the center. And I'm going to start by just taking a ruler and I'm going to perpendicularly track them up to the surface, but no farther. So watch this real carefully here. I'm actually even using the, the inches as a sort of guide to make sure I stay perpendicular. I'm going to track 810 up to the surface like so. And I'm going to track 816 up to the surface. Oh shoot, Jordan, I, I can't, uh, I can't do your phone with the damn, I don't have the thumb for it. 
sorry. Oh, shit. Okay. Sorry, I've really got, I wish my phone was working, but it's, uh, they're still seeing us. That's good. So just go to the care wrap. Thank you. All right. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to track an angle from the center of the disc where the, the tick mark is, and I'm going to have it intersect with the surface intersection of the sunspot. This is a top-down view, and we're going to be watching the sunspot rotate across the disc. Extend this line out like wicked far like as far as you possibly can on both sides. I'm going to do this factory style for this guy as well. I'm going to extend, I'm going to choose um, 730 and 83 to extend up to the surface. There's 730. There's 8.3, and I'm going to extend this angle wicked far out. Um, you know, a big part of this lab is me kind of looking at what you're doing and then complaining about it. So there's, there's what I have. <clears throat> Why don't you guys start showing me what you got here? Let me go into tile mode. Brandon, can you get a little closer? Because I can't get bigger or I'll lose this phone. Uh, 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 Ian, can you get closer? Like way closer. Ian, I like it. Ian, I like it. Michaela, I like it. Uh, Tess, I like it. Oh, you guys are doing pretty good for freehand. Megan, a little closer, buddy. Are you freehand? Can you, you don't have a straight edge? Those look like freehand. Like I can understand the circle being freehand, but what about the lines? You know, um, they're freehand. You can't, uh, Dennis, Dennis you, you can't find a single ruler in your damned house. Not one ruler. Do you live in a rulerless house? Me? No, Megan. No, oh, I definitely have some. Um, it's just the laziness. I'll use my calculator or, I'll, or, or a book. Okay. How yeah. does this one look? You can find straight things laying around, like use a book or a calculator or a notepad. Hell, even like a, even a little post-it note thing, right? That's straight. I mean, Megan, it's, it's okay, all right? I'm still gonna give you points, but you know, I'm not asking you to go like 100% here. I was thinking maybe like 35% or 40%. Just making the line straight would be kind of at like the 35%. Commitment. I will try. All right, okay. All right, all right. All right, now you're going to learn how to use a protractor. I'm presuming, probably correctly, that you don't have a protractor at your house. But you should really pay attention here. I want to teach you guys how this works. To use a protractor, what you do is you take this you take this circle and you put it at the vertex of the angle. The vertex is where the uh, elbow is, okay? And then you pin the vertex with your pencil. You pin and you spin. So I'm gonna pin it and spin it until the zero degree line, which is here, lines up with one of my arms. Clearly, this angle is less than 90, so I can read off my protractor. What would you guys say this angle is? Seventy-nine. Nope. Oh no, seventy-four. Sorry. Sure. Seventy-four degrees. Now, I don't know if your angle is going to be seventy-four degrees. I'm guessing if you were freehanding it, it's not going to be quite as precise, but. 
kudos to you if you got it anywhere close. Uh, let's try this one. I'm going to pin it and spin it. So I pin with my pencil and I spin until zero degrees lines up, then I clamp it down. Ooh, that's an annoying one. What do we think? Fifty-seven degrees. Okay. Ah. Focus. All right. All right. Um, let's get the time interval for spot A. How many days was it from here to here? Ten days. No. Six days. It's eight ten to eight sixteen would be six days, right? That's what you meant, I'm sure. So if your time interval six days, all right? Um, now to get our angular velocity, an angular velocity is a measurement of the degrees that your sunspot rotates per day. And one of the cool things about units is units kind of tell you what the formula is. What formula do you, how should I get my degrees per day if I have an angle in degrees and I have a time in days? You divide the degree by the amount of days that we have. Exactly. The units kind of tell you what the formula is. So we'll do 74 divided by 6. How many sig figs do you think we should keep? Two. Yeah, I'm going to assume that when they measured the time interval that they did it in the same number of days. Actually, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to keep three for now to avoid rounding errors. And I'm going to make it 12.3 degrees per day. But at the end, we're going to have to round back to two. I'm just trying to stop some intermediate rounding issues. Let's do this one now. Ooh, how many? Oh, this is annoying. Uh... May is five, six is June, seven is July. How many days are in July? Thirty-one. So how many days would it be between uh, seven thirty and eight thirty? Five. Mm, I don't know if I like that. 30 to 31, right? That's one day. 31 to 1. That's two days. Four. Yeah, three days is 1 to 2. Does everyone see how that works? From the 30th to the 31 is one day. Do you see what I'm doing there? All right. Hopefully I've convinced you. Okay. So what's our angular velocity here? 57 degrees divided by four days. Fourteen point two five, or do you want to go? Do you want to do three keep six? It, yeah, keeps always keeping the same seas to to keep it, you know, consistent. Fourteen point three. Don't forget to put your units on of degrees per day, please. All right, now we've got to take our average angular velocity. 
So we have to average 12.3 degrees per day and 14.3 degrees per day. The idea is that one of our spots was a little bit above the equator, the other's a little bit below. If we take the average, that should get us pretty close to the equator. So 14.3, oh, it's gonna be 13.3, isn't it? Divide by two. Duh, easy. So our average is 13.3 degrees. Let's flip over to the next page. We're gonna skip spot C because we all have lives to live, all right? And I think two sunspots gets you the right idea. So the average angular velocity was 13.3 degrees per day. Now, hear me out on this logic here. Imagine that I have a full three-dimensional sun. And imagine I'm watching a sunspot as it kind of travels around a complete circle at that latitude. How many degrees is it going to rotate in a complete period? How many degrees to go around the sun? 360. Good. So I'm going to argue that if the average is 13.3 degrees rotated in one day, that at the same rate, that's going to be equal to 360 degrees over P sin, where P is the synodic period, and I'll explain the synodic period later. So if I solve for P sin, the synodic period, the synodic period is 360 degrees over 13.3 degrees per day. What's that give you? About 27 days. Let's make keep three sig figs for now. The synodic rotation period is 27. I got 27.1 days. Is that what you got? Whoever was talking to me? Yes. Michaela? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, now watch this maneuver. You might wonder why is it a synodic period? The reason is, is because you were on a moving Earth. And Earth was rotating during those 10 or 6 days that you were tracking the spot. So in some sense, it's kind of like you're tracking the synodic period, like it was Mercury. And you can use the same formula to calculate the sidereal period. From chapter S1, that formula was basically 360, this is the version of it in days, 365.25 times the synodic over 365.25 plus the synodic period. And that'll give us our answer in days, but we've got to use the parentheses. So we'll do 365.25 times 27.1 divided by, open parentheses, 365.25 plus 27.1, close parentheses, equals. And now we'll round it back to two sig figs. To get 25 days. And uh, can you just go back to the the, yep. Thank you. How did our answer compare to today's lecture? Oh. 
Could you actually go back? I'm sorry. Just a moment. How'd our answer compare to today's lecture? Same thing, right? Yeah. Nice. Uh, what do you need, uh, Tess? Just the last part of the paper. Uh, as long as the phone will share it, I will share it. <clears throat> Is that what you mean? Uh, no, the equation. That's what I it's the number of days in a sidereal year times the synodic period divided by the sum of the days per year. What's okay, thank you. Period? Basically, you learned it earlier in years as synodic period over synodic period plus one year. That's how you learned it earlier. Here we're doing it in days instead of in years. We don't have anything for spot C, time interval, and angular velocity, right? There's nothing in there? Nah, I decided we would do two spots because that already took us up to 355. See what I'm saying? True. With the technical glitches and all. Also, I think two spots is better because if you bias two to the north and one to the south, it's an uneven number and it might skew your direction north or south. <clears throat> Okay, well, I want to apologize for a kind of, uh, hold on, wait, I got some chats here. I got to check out. Zach, this is, we skipped lab seven. We're going to do lab seven later this week. I thought I had made that clear to everyone, but maybe not. I want to apologize for having a sort of low energy lecture today. I was a little... Uh, I was lacking in juice, okay? I'll try to have more juice in my caboose next time. Oh, so it's okay. What's that, Megan? I said I feel you, so it's okay. Yeah, I, I don't think I was the only one that was low energy today. I think you guys are all... Yeah, everyone I, was, I, I had two hours of sleep, so I was uh, not doing right. too much. Well, that's the real death knell. You know, if the professor is low energy and the students are high energy, you can usually get through it. Or if you guys are low energy and I'm bouncing off the walls, then I can, you know, force you to get into it. But when we're all low energy, that's pretty bad. <laughs> then it becomes a bit of a grind. And it's too bad because that lecture is normally one of my best of the semester. I, I was also feeling stressed about the fact that I only have three classes left with you. And there's like kind of a lot to do. So I think my strategy for the next two classes is to slow down and have fun with it, even at the expense of not covering some cool stuff. I think it's better when we go slower, all right? It's less of a drink out of the fire hose, you know? Okay, so what you guys can turn into me is the stuff that you have written down on your pages. Does that make sense? And hey, I need, not everybody's kind of with us here in the live setting, which bothers me a bit, but it's so important that you guys, we've already done the work together. I can see you guys writing down as we go. It's so important that you don't doink around and you get that, you get those things loaded up. That way I can grade them. I don't want the end of the semester to come and to find out that you had actually done the work, but just forgot to upload the files. That would be an icky situation because then you'll lose points. You guys can see how important it is to average your homework and your lab scores, right? And everybody's doing pretty good right now. Like I won't show the class, but, uh, Right now, it's all A's and B's and C's. And some people, I haven't graded your, your last labs. I'm missing five out of nine last labs. So I think that'll bump everyone up a bit. So nobody's failing the course. Everyone's doing just fine. And you will continue to do just fine as long as we keep getting in those homeworks and labs. OK? OK, cool. All right, anything else that we need to talk about? I'll do the, uh, the lenses and telescopes lab on Wednesday. Okay. Anyone have any other questions for me or?
stuff that we didn't talk about. You, you cool about your grade? You understand what it all means now? If, if you need a, a sort of grade report, if you want to know, I guess, I don't know if I'm supposed to do midterm grades, but I don't think so for summer because it's so fast. But if you're curious about how you're doing, just send me an email and I'll, I'll bounce the numbers to you, okay? All right, guys. Oh, Brandon? Oh, I was just saying lit. <laughs> okay. I'm stopping the recording.